here. Thank you for being here. And thank you to those of you who are online for being here as well. Um, uh, for those of you who are online, um, almost everybody here knows who I am. Uh, my name is Tuba, and I am the co-chair of this um, decadal survey for the Ocean Sciences Committee. Um, my other co-chair is um, Jim Yoder, who is online. Um, I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good morning, Jim. Um, yesterday, we had some amazing sessions, and I want to once more um, thank um, uh, Layla and Mona um, for facilitating them. Um, that was really excellent, and it was wonderful for me to sort of just be in this uh, uh, listening mode. So I really appreciated the work that you all did. Um, today, this morning, we do have another set of very exciting panels. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about artificial intelligence and what we can do with that, and also talk about ocean life, biodiversity, um, issues as well as response to climate change. So these are going to be some very exciting panels, and I look forward to learning more this morning. Um, and uh, before we uh, jump right into the panels, I, again, I want to thank our host, Layla, um, and the University of Southern Mississippi. This has been an amazing room to be in. Really worked well in terms of just the sound quality, the fact that we have windows, and um, and the lovely Gulf Coast air. Thank you. And you said maybe you want to say a few yeah, words? Yeah, really quickly. Um, that was a perfect um, segue. I really wanted to thank these two gentlemen, uh, Chris Kirby and Ricky Slaughter. Um, they did all of them. Thank you for being part to make sure that we have the setting and the environment to be very communicative, and they're probably dying of embarrassment. So, you guys <laughs> so thank you. Um, so I just wanted to welcome everyone again to the University of Southern Mississippi. I'm really happy we were able to provide this setting for a discussion. Um, a couple of reminders: if you need uh, bathrooms, like once again, they're in either direction. I didn't say this yesterday and I should have. There are emergency exits on either ends of the hall. So if anything happens, go in either direction and you will be fine. Um, and if anyone needs to step out and take a meeting or a call throughout the day, the conference room immediately across the hall is open. So just pop in and, um, and use it as, as much as you like. Um, the thing I wanted just to, to say this morning, you know, just as, as kind of a welcome, um, was uh, to tell just a really quick story about Gilbert R. Mason. Um, we've been talking about ships a lot um, in, in the, the last couple of days or the last day. We've also been talking about building a diverse and equitable uh, future for ocean science. And I just wanted to take a, a minute to talk about um, that name. Um, he is the namesake for the future NSF research vessel that is being uh, built uh, at this moment, uh, about an hour, two hours from here, um, that will operate out of uh, out of Gulfport, of Mississippi. Um, and while you may have heard the name, you may not know anything about him. And I think that might be true for, for most of the folks in the room. Um, and uh, you know, it's the the name of of uh, naming the ship after Gilbert Mason. It's not just him; it's his family is, that is wrapped in that name, and it is an aspirational story but it's also an accountability story and it's one that you know we we are hoping to um, to be accountable to so um, Gilbert Mason was neither a ocean scientist he was also not an astronaut so <laughs> a little bit of a, a different name he actually was a physician and uh, he uh, had his practice in uh, Biloxi throughout the entirety um, of his life it's just the next uh, city over um, and he is known for a number of things throughout his, his life. Um, he provided medical service to the Mariner community in uh, South Mississippi, as well as in the New Orleans area. Um, but the reason he has uh, placards throughout the, the Gulf South is that um, in his earlier years, in the 1950s, he uh, organized wade-ins. Um, in the, Belux the beaches of Biloxi to desegregate those beaches. And those wade-ins often turned uh, very violent. Um, they, were, they were dangerous things to do, but um, he was committed to doing this, um, he and his community, so that um, the beaches could be open to all. Um, and he's also known for larger civil rights activism throughout the state of Mississippi and his work to desegregate the schools in uh, Mississippi. Uh, which ultimately happened in 1967. And there's a 
fun side story there about the challenge coins that we had at the keel lane for um, for the the vessel several years ago that I can tell you um, tell you offline about that that particular day. Uh, but he did these things for his family so that his children could have um, access to education. Um, and, and one of his children came uh, went on to be a a physician as well. Um, his civil rights activities so that he that he did he carried them out with his wife uh, Natalie as well, um, who was a social uh, work professor at the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, he did this all for his community so that all could have equal access to the beaches of of Mississippi. And this is the reason why we have named the ship after a civil rights leader who was a physician in, in Mississippi, not an astronaut, not. Yeah. No um, and it's why the ship carries the model motto of equal access to the sea. That's where that all comes from. It's his legacy. It's his family's legacy. Um, and it's a legacy that we're holding up for future scientists and the scientific enterprise that, that we will be able to support. Um, and it's also a legacy of accountability. We know that, you know, we put up a name like that and we have a responsibility to be accountable. Um, you know, to the work that we want to do, we being the scientific community. And I will say that the Mason family is watching very closely and we want them involved in this because we want that kind of accountability. So it's a it's a fun aspirational story. Um, our plan is to tell everybody the story every time they come on the ship, but we don't have the ship. So I just figured I'd <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was wonderful. It's really great to hear what the background of that is. Much appreciated. What did you pass away? Um, he passed away in 1997, and and his uh, son Gilbert Mason Jr. passed away last year. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great story. Good motivation, and a nice opener for today. With that, Marcia, I will hand it over to you. All right. So today, um, we're going to have a panel for opportunities for AI and ML to advance ocean sciences. And so we're, what we're looking for today is um, to learn a little bit more about opportunities for artificial intelligence and machine learning to advance social sciences. So we have three panelists today, uh, Warren Wood from the uh, U.S. Naval Research Laboratory, Peter Gerstoff from Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and Heidi Sosik from the Tull Oceanographic Institute. We've asked each of the panelists to start with a um, short uh, presentation on their own work. And then we have a few questions that uh, we've come up with to talk about this topic. And then we can open it up to questions on Slido. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Warren. Thank you very much. And uh, is, it, is it possible for you to let me uh, talk from up there? Yeah, I can. Did you email me your slides? Um, I can. So, for, I don't know. I'm not familiar with Zoom, so maybe uh, any other shares. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll just I'll just uh, do a brief a brief introduction here. My name is Warren Ward. I'm, I work for the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. Work with a bunch of people, and we have been working in machine learning now for probably seven or eight years. Um, it actually kind of sneaks up on you. Um, um, so I just wanted to come up with a, just start off with a few things. Uh, you know, a lot of people who you know who are unfamiliar with the, uh, the topic say, well, you know, can AI or machines can they are they going to take over and do science? Uh, I don't know, but they can certainly help. And I, the way we've used. Uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is as a tool to help us do more with what we have. So, uh, you know, in the past we've had, uh, you know, people can program machines to do uh, simple things very, very fast. Right now we are teaching the machines to do more sophisticated things, uh, recognize the various patterns and, and uh, so on, and then use those patterns to make predictions. And then in the future, you know, self-teaching or self-learning will, you know, will AI take over the world? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure how good humans are at self-teaching sometimes. But I'm just speaking for myself. Um, so it's a very powerful software tool. I'm not sure it's much more than that at this point. So 
in the past, we've had tremendous, um, you know, changes in our society from things like photography, programmable computer, mass vaccinations. I think of um, AI as just kind of one, one more step and, and not anything, you know, horrific or dangerous. Um, so with our motivation here at the year uh, at the Naval Research Laboratory, and, and I work uh, just not too far here from the Gulf Board at the Stennis Space Center. Um, our motivation is understanding the environment in a, in a comprehensive way. And, and we have, uh, for the atmosphere, you know, the atmosphere and the oceans have necessarily been uh, sort of dealt with on a, a holistic global scale uh, for, for, you know, their entire existence on this, right? Because the, clearly the air is connected everywhere and the sea is connected everywhere. Uh, geology has a different history, one of resource extraction. And so, uh, we end up doing a lot of uh, sort of postage stamp type, high, super high resolution studies, uh, very lots of data, but at uh, very local, uh, very local geographic spots. And so, uh, how can we get a, a, a more holistic picture and prediction of the seabed? Uh, the idea is, uh, our in our this is an example of machine learning. So we have all these sparse data points, and what we'd love to do is come up with a comprehensive map. And so we've uh, developed this uh, tool that we call geospatial machine learning. Uh, essentially, it's a it's a very fancy way of, of interpolating or mapping. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but the fundamental steps here are data curation. Uh, this turns out to be way harder than we ever thought it would be. Um, a lot of data, especially geologic, seabed geologic data, is in a variety of different forms and formats, and getting those all uh, so the machine can. Uh, and can understand them is uh, is no small task. We also need uh, predictors. So we the way this works is we have um, things that we know everywhere and things that we know in certain places. And we'd like to know, we'd like to predict those data values everywhere. But we can only predict where we have features. So the features are things like bathymetry and uh, spatial statistics of bathymetry. And I'll show a couple of examples of that. Then we use our machine learning. We have a training phase where we train the, where we have the observation. So this machine learning can really only predict uh, in the area. Uh, really only predict in the area. So we try to put that, we train it, and then we can predict. And then we use a uh, conformal uncertainty to estimate kind of how sure we are of that, of that prediction. So the data curation, again, tons and tons of data out there. Uh, getting into a usable form is a is a is a task that we eyeball each end. Uh, the predictors again things like uh, elevation, which is global elevation, which is a, a roughness over a radius of a hundred uh, hundred meters. So a very very uh, small scale. We go all the way from uh, you know hundred to five hundred to about uh, hundred meters uh, scale in mean, spatial statistics. And we calculate things like position index, which is the the peakiness essentially of, of what's down there. Uh, also, uh, I wanted to point out, you know, I know this is an oceans uh, oriented uh, uh, meeting, but we also can do uh, things on land. So we have a refractory calcite from geologic maps. And uh, again, we can calculate rock and position index with one of those. Any of those periods on land, so I'd like to do it with the And uh, again, I'm not going to go through too much of the detail here in my in my five minute intro, but essentially what we're doing is uh, if, we, if we think about this map up here as as a map of what we want to know, and these would be our our features or predictors. What we're what we're trying to do is say, okay, well, here's here's where we want to predict. And if we look down here at all these predictors, the values of each of these uh, predictors. Is there's might be closest in terms of uh, in terms of geology space, not geographic space. Geographically, it's on the other side of the world, but geologically, it might be very similar to a given observed value. And so, what we do is say, okay, well, the, if this is the observed value that's closest in geology space to this, then we assume that our, the value of what we want to know is the same as that observed value. And this is, um, you know, it's it's essentially a statistical engine. And it comes up with a um, essentially a prediction or an outcast. We get an uncertainty associated with that. And what's kind of nice is that we also get a guide to the next uh, where to make the next observation, right? So we, we can uh, statistically point to a place where uh, another observation would be would be valuable. And then our conformal uncertainty. This is uh, this is much harder to explain, but uh, essentially what we're one way to estimate uncertainty is just to assume a single uncertainty everywhere. 
And so let's say we're going to uh, predict the bathymetry. You could say, well, the bathymetry uncertainty is just a given value. And that represents this uh, pink band here, which uh, you know, sometimes overestimates the uncertainty and sometimes underestimates it. A little bit better uh, technique is to use this informal uncertainty technique where we can have a, uh, the, the data in, uh, the data itself drive the uncertainty prediction and drive the uncertainty estimate. So here's a, here's a prediction of our bathymetry and here's a uh, prediction of the uncertainty that goes along with that. And you can see that uh, you know, different features are so uh, different features have different uncertainties. Uh, the blue is low here, so where we have actually bathymetric surveys, uh, the, the uncertainty here. So uh, I just want to finish up with a couple of published examples. Here's one for uh, total organic carbon at the seafloor that uh, we published a few years ago out of our lab. Uh, that's been getting a lot of uh, a lot of studies. It's been very useful to. Uh, to taking an inventory, taking inventories of uh, components or see that properties uh, is very useful. We have also looked at uh, categorical predictions, uh, one of which is these uh, sea fleas or sea floor fluid expulsion anomalies. Predicting anomalies, it turns out, is kind of challenging because, uh, uh, it's, uh, like I said, the uh, prediction engine really can only predict things that it has seen before. So if it's anomalous, uh, that's it's a little tricky, but Read the paper. Uh, ben, ben did a good job on that. Uh, another another example is a mass accumulation rate, a mass accumulation rate, so a sediment essentially accumulation rate, um, published a couple of years ago. And I think this this represented a major upgrade to uh, estimates that have been made, uh, previously. Also, I mentioned you can do things on land. Uh, I've been looking at a little bit of uh, geochemistry. Um, groundwater geochemistry, uh, most of the data actually just comes from Australia and the United States, but fortunately, Australia and the United States and, and also Brazil and, and Chile cover a wide variety of, uh, of uh, groundwater uh, situations. And, and from those, I think we can get a pretty good estimate of uh, this. We can span the space, if you want, the geochemistry, the groundwater geochemistry space. Then we come up with predictions of things like uh, global bicarbonate concentration. So that's uh, that's my intro talk, and uh, I'm obviously uh, happy to entertain you. Anybody. Yeah, thanks, Warren. Um, right now, I don't see any questions on Slido, um, but I'm sure that uh, people are thinking about what to ask. But we'll have a bunch of time for questions at the panel discussion. So next, we're going to hear from Hadi Sosek. Good morning, everyone. Let me share my screen. Okay, I hope you see my title slide. Does everything look okay there? Yeah. Yes, looks great. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share some um, ideas about the value of AI and ML in research on plankton ecosystems, um, marine ecosystems in general. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna focus um, my talk mostly on um, imaging in the ocean. Our ability to image has really exploded in recent years. Imaging flow cytobot I'll highlight is one example. This is an automated submersible microscope. It, it takes images like you see here at rates of tens of thousands per hour. And because these images have about one micron resolution, we can identify many imaged organisms to genus or, or species with, with this approach. The uh, technology is automated and it's designed for extended deployments. So we now have high resolution, multi-decade time series of images at places like the Martha's Vineyard Coastal Observatory, as well as now uh, growing spatial detail from uh, approaches like seasonal process studies that extend from the nearshore observatory across the continental shelf, and uh, a, now a decade of even broader spatial surveys along the eastern uh, seaboard of the U.S. from North Carolina to, to Canada. And each, each of the points on these maps is a place where an IFCB sample and, and thousands of images have been collected. These already really large data sets are growing rapidly. The, uh, and IFCB is imaging it at MVCO right now while I'm speaking to you. 
Um, I got back uh, from a winter process transit cruise uh, just two days ago, and a broad scale survey on a NOAA ship is, uh, is underway right now. With these data streams, we can characterize absolutely amazing uh, species specific dynamics. Here, I'm just gonna highlight for you uh, an important chain forming diatom in this ecosystem. This uh, daily resolved time series from MBCO helps us see in an unprecedented way the, the very strong seasonality, high interannual variation in this organism. And then with the, with the uh, broad scale surveys, uh, we can generate things like these composite seasonal maps that come from a, a decade observations and show that this organism that we know is important in the near shore is also um, blooming in specific patterns with seasons across the entire region. This is only one of many, many species in the, in the ecosystem. And images of this particular organism comprise way less than 1% of the nearly uh, one and a half billion images that are in these data sets. So uh, ML is uh, very critical for analysis of this data set. There's no way we, we can, as humans, we can sift through billions of images. We're currently using a 155 category convolutional neural network to classify these images. This is a supervised algorithm. So highly high quality training data is really essential to get this uh, kind of good performance. I want to emphasize that um, we're not only using uh, ML for this kind of quantitative abundance patterns through time and space that I showed on the previous slide, but we're also able to study important processes that are happening at microscopic scales. This classifier performs really well for the diatom species I've been talking about, both when it's healthy, but also when it's infected by these tiny lethal uh, parasites that show up very clearly in the images. This means that we can uh, learn that, we have been able to learn that the parasite uh, infections in this ecosystem are recurrent, both at the near shore observatory, this is the diatom time series again, where the darker points indicate very high levels of parasite infection prevalence. This is a lethal parasite, parasite I should say, so it's very important to the dynamics of this organism. And it's important at the Nearshore Observatory and also across uh, the, the broad scale. This uh, revelation has implications not only for the dynamics of this particular species, but also for uh, food webs, carbon and nutrient um, transfer through the, the, the ecosystem, et cetera. And it's leading us to new hypotheses linked to the uh, ecosystem response to climate change in this region. I want to tell you that these days, the Martha's Vineyard Observatory is just one of uh, many time series. Um, IFCBs are being deployed all along the US coastline by a wide variety of users now. And, and in addition to basic research, this network of sites is helping to provide early warning and better understanding of um, many things like harmful algal bloom species that produce toxins that can threaten food safety for humans and also cause other ecological problems like fish kills. And as you can imagine, ML is essential for timely and effective use of these observations this, in the same way that we're doing uh, with the basic research. And uh, this is, it doesn't really stop here because IFCB users around the world are starting new, new time series locations and conducting large scale uh, spatial surveys with high throughput imaging and just, you know, to beat a dead horse, strategic use of AI is the key to making the most of these huge and growing data sets. I want to just close um, my last minute or so by bringing up another imaging approach. We're uh, complementing IFCB with centimeter scale imaging to capture patterns higher up the food web, so zooplankton, and also the dynamics of marine snow. Oh, the video is not going. Here we go. Dynamics of uh, marine snow distributions. Here you see uh, data collected with this uh, sensor platform that's profiling up and down as it's towed behind a ship and collecting uh, images at 15 hertz, 15 images a second, and uh, improving our ability to use AI and ML models to locate, classify, and characterize targets in these really complex images is a big 
a really big challenge that we're uh, tackling now. I mentioned um, that I just uh, just got back from a, a winter process cruise. We were doing that kind of um, towed operation on, on the ship earlier this week, but we had to end the cruise early and run into sheltered nearshore waters because as I think most of you know, a major gale blew up through, through the entire uh, Eastern US and we could not safely operate from the research ship. Uh, it was really exciting because as we were coming in, running away from the storm, we passed this uh, long range autonomous vehicle heading out directly into the winter storm. Uh, and I'm excited to tell you that um, I'm collaborating with a talented engineering team in Woods Hole and also a, a camera system developers at a small company, uh, Bellamare, to get this uh, prototype imaging system similar to the one on the tow vehicle that's now on the nose of this autonomous vehicle. It's on its first science mission. As of this morning, the vehicle had, had completed the entire cross shelf transect and is headed, uh, turned around at as far off the road point. It's on its way home. And it's collecting about a terabyte of images a day. Um, right, right now, of course, it's not practical to transmit that kind of raw data uh, back home from an autonomous vehicle out, out in the open waters. So the demand now is for effective AI on board things like AEVs so that we can uh, send home only a lower volume processed information. And um, this will also open up the door for real-time interpretation and adaptive sampling based on the imaging while it's happening so that going forward, we can do the smartest observing we can across time and space while also resolving the kind of biological detail that we really need to understand how ecosystems function and how they're changing. And I, would, I will leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. Um, that was fascinating. I think we'll go ahead and go to Peter and then we can take a few questions off Slido before we start the panel discussions. Peter, thanks for joining us so early on the West Coast. I think you're on mute. Okay, so now you can see everything. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so so this is I'm Peter Gerstaft. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm at the uh, at UCSD on the west coast here, and I have my website here. You can see more of what I do. I do uh, machine learning in acoustics and seismics. So machine learning and and uh, artificial intelligence is, I think, about the same thing. Oh, why? Uh, okay, so machine learning, they combine, there's strong statistics and computer science in machine learning. Uh, and to obtain the model. So it's not just magic when we combine them. Machine learning is based on the theory for model identification, control, and estimation. And neural network approximation are solved very fast with modern architecture, leading to very excitement. Um, an example of, of machine learning and how it influences is that I did a class on on data assimilation, I had about 10 students, and then I decided to change it to machine learning for physical applications. Then the only thing I did was making the title. Then I had 65 students, and it grew to 245 stu graduate students in 2020. Uh, so I think to attract students, we have to have some machine learning. 
So I like to have the basic principle of machine learning here. This is a function approximation problem. Uh, so we have, uh, we approximate this function here. We have our outputs here and we have features that we observe. And from that, we want to extract this unknown function relationship here. We can use supervised learning where the outputs are labeled and we need lots of data to train it. Or the more interesting part, at least scientific, is unsupervised learning when there is no label. The goal is to find the interesting properties. And a good example is what we call an autoencoder, where we learn uh, to represent the data with itself. And in order, sort of new, in order to to uh, learn, or this shows it here, we have weights of the neural network we have to learn. So we have to train on model data. And to, to verify the model, we, we keep a part of the data separately and we test on these to measure how well the, the method generalize. And this is very relevant to use this approach when we can't be explained with existing models. So if we have a good physical model, we should of course use this. I would stress that it's much more than just neural network. And actually I work a lot with all these methods here. There's many more methods. So, so in order to do physics machine learning, we need some physics in the system. If we just use a basic machine learning approach, I illustrated with this pendulum here, we, we have these points here, we just measure them here, and then we can make the curve fit to here, but it doesn't generalize. Remember, the important thing is that our methods generalize well. And here we are just meet, messing the least square. If we knew, knew it was some kind of physics system, we know the PDE, the partial differential equation, we can put that into the physical system. This is what done here. We have the PDE here encoded into the system. And that way it's a much, much uh, we went back. It's a much simpler system and we can now, it generalize well, you can see I can predict everything well. This, this applies to data simulation as well. Same thing there, we have equations into the as well. The unique thing is that these derivatives, we can actually do analytic with we have back propagation because back propagation automatically gives us these derivative. Mm -hmm. I think an important thing in physics is that we have some uncertainty quantifications in computer science. It's not so important to have much uncertainty, but if we want to predict the value, uncertainty is just as important as the value itself. So uncertainty qualification is a little bit underrepresented in machine learning at the moment. I illustrated here with an example for Gaussian processes. And here we have a function with a prior here, uniform prior. And this is possible realizations I have here. And as we get more points, you can see we have more knowledge of the environment because we have measurements. And then we can reduce the uncertainty in neighboring areas. And this seems to adapt as we move along as certain things here. There's many ways to do machine learning. We do Monte Carlo Gaussian process, some kind of uncertainty qualification where we just have typically a number representing the uncertainty. And with conformal prediction, we can guarantee it arrives within a certain uncertainty interval. And this influence also may be propagation of uncertainty 
we can put in uncertainty in the latent variables in a neural network. If we have explainable measures, that would also give a confidence in the model. And that's also related to uncertainty, I think, pattern detection. All these are good. We do also say machine learning for ocean and climate science. When we do data simulation, this is important. We can learn emulators and surrogators by modeling. These will be a higher resolution. We don't have resolution problem with, with, with these. We can do better f f physics because we learn the surrogate models for the unresolved processes and faster to compute because we can use a neural network. And uh, so the data simulation with machine learning, we can adjust more observational data, we can learn observational operators, but we need more uncertainty qualification in this process. So similar to things we already do, but faster and more precise. Uh, this is my take on machine learning in the next decade. We will of course have AI assistance for the scientists to perform tasks that can be specified literature survey, gather data, write code, implement the analysis, create the draft papers, review papers, and these things. So with all, all these here, this will have human learning problems summing, uh, for example, improved forecast. I think some of the cool topic is when we can do multimodal sensing with AE, I could see combining a video and sound in observation in a uh, sink ocean observatory. If we have a camera, can we put sound on it also? So we can combine sound and, and video. There's no, I don't know of a physical process that can do this. So we have to use machine learning to teach how they hang together. We could say a satellite could have by just looking at a satellite, we could have predict ocean background noise. We observe rain, waves, chlorophyll, and from that we can extract the noise. We can predict turbulence, hyperspectral sensitivity, climate change, ocean model. So in all this, humans will work closely with AI to vet the outputs that we learn. I was thinking other things we could reduce the whole academic fleet and just have robots sailing out in the ocean and drop the acoustic buoys, the seismic buoys and take some water samples all around. And that would maybe be very efficient. Risk of AI is of course, we will get fake papers. We'll get too many papers. They might even replace the apprenticeships, graduate students, replace scientists and we all see an example here of, of fake people coming up with the GAN generalized adversary networks. I had an introduction of machine learning and ocean acoustics where you have more details here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That, that was great. Um, we have a number of really good questions on Slido, so I'm just going to ask one question from my, my questions for the panel, and then we can move to Slido. So the one question that um, I want to start with is, um, what do you think the future needs for the cyber infrastructure will be to support AI ML? And we'll just go in the order um, that we have the panel. Um, so Warren? Yeah, I would say the short answer is um, data data curation and data communication. Essentially, what AI is uh, is an information science. And you know, we we're all most of us here are probably trained in the earth sciences. And I think uh, well, the the biggest hurdle in in uh, getting to use AI uh, effectively is to become enough of a data scientist that we understand how how data are. Uh, 
Yeah, I think I'll, I would like to emphasize that um, we really need data to information, full pipelines that are documented, reproducible, and that include um, full provenance tracking, not just traceability from end products back to raw data, but also all the algorithms, models, and parameters along that full path from one to the from one end to the other. And this is a this is a really big challenge to build and standardize enough so that we can catalyze an active community of of data generators and data users. Um, it's somewhat akin to the big data centers operated by you know agencies like NASA. Um, where you know the critical data streams from Earth or Earth observing satellites are supported with products that can be easily reprocessed, and there's some flourishing control and standard pipelines. But the problem is bigger for our community because our data sources are so heterogeneous, um, and the data generators are um, very diverse and um, heterogeneous. So it's not there's kind of point source data data all over the place um, instead of a centralized small number of highly curated satellite pay lives. So it's a big challenge. Peter? So yes, I think we need a, a data center that could collect all the data together. And of course that will be very diverse, but I think we just start by putting it in and maybe machine learning could put system in them one day But, but some kind of collecting of data, maybe in an ocean chat TPP might make, make this easier to access. Yeah, I think accessibility is gonna be a big issue. Uh, so I'm actually gonna to move to Slido because there's some really great questions on there. And Leila, you have a question on Slido? Yep, um, so the, the zeitgeist is a particular mood or spirit um, of, a, of a particular point in history. And I, all of the speakers touch on a sense of the zeitgeist around machine learning. Um, and I wanted to see if, if you all would lean into a, a little bit of words of inspiration or caution as we try to capture this moment and this zeitgeist in our report um, and how it can, can or cannot address grand challenges and issues. Go ahead. Take a shot at that. So, as I said, I think uh, AI is a uh, step change in the in, a, in the power of fullness of uh, computing. So, as such, it's a tool, and uh, any I think any tool has, you know, can be used, uh, you know, for good or for ill. And it, I think that uh, some of the risks, you know, there are risks with every new technology. Like we have. Uh, new weapons, you know, atomic weapons that created a lot of risk. And, uh, you know, when we have uh, any, any kind of new technology represents a way that uh, people can help society or hurt society. And so I, I think that there's always a little bit of a wild west anytime you get a new technology. And I think we're, mm -hmm. we're in that right now. And so I don't know if the uh, there are no societal norms really, I think, established to uh, prevent somebody from submitting a fake paper. Uh, and then we have to ask ourselves, well, if the fake paper is really good, maybe that's not a bad thing. So let's just not be so fearful and let's, let's think about what, uh, maybe the fake paper is better than you know, some of the other papers. But, so let's think about how to use this uh, properly, right? And how we can, how we can, uh, Best to use it to advance science or advance uh, society, but there are, I think there are always going to be people out there who are going to want to want to use it to uh, to do horrible things, um, and I think that's true in every uh, every possible tool you could have. Misinformation, misinformation, disinformation. Right. But, you know, the first time somebody, you know, some caveman or something picked up a stick and killed his neighbor. Uh, you know, it's a fifth, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're and there are good people, and there are people that are out to destroy things. I think it was a cave woman who killed her husband. I think that's the. deserved <laughs> 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 it. I'm not judging him for something. You know, the one analogy that I was shared that makes sense to me is the calculator. 
when we calculated first came on board, people were like, what? Our kids must know how to add and subtract and multiply. And But now the calculator is an integral tool in us teaching math to teach the 12 students. And so, it, but it was definitely perceived as a threat to math at first. Yeah, people will always feel threatened. Some people will always feel threatened by new technology. Um, you know, I'm a little threatened by Zoom, as you can see. And, <laughs> if I could jump in, I, I'd like to uh, add another slightly different perspective. Um, I think, you know, in terms of inspiration, we're, we can do things with AI ML that we just can't do any other way. So that, I mean, hands down, I feel strongly about that. But instead of talking about risks in terms of bad actors, though, I think we should also be very mindful about, you know, good intentioned scientific or research uses that might go awry if we don't, if we're not careful enough about doing the hard work to verify and um, the performance of any kind of algorithm that we're going to use to either interpret data or uh, discover patterns. And we're, there's no way to get around that. We, we can't just take it ML, AI and ML as a, as a black box uh, and there, it's hard work. Yeah, do you have any uh, thoughts on inspiration? Uh, I'm here. I don't have questions at the moment or comments at the moment. All right. I think Kristen, you have a question. Yeah, this is for all of the panelists. Um, how should AI and I, I guess also machine learning training? be incorporated into our teaching at undergraduate and graduate levels um, for those who are going into ocean sciences. Um, I can see how uh, maybe we're lagging behind the need at the moment and ramping this up is going to it's going to probably take a lot. And strategies for doing that would be appreciated. So you're not talking about teaching AI ML, you're talking about using AI ML in no, the teaching whole, process. The whole thing. Like if we if the work if this is now a workforce need that we're on the edge of, or then how do we meet that workforce development need in higher education? Um, Peter, since you have 245 students in there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when when I first taught it, actually it was just image processing we did, because there was no physical incorporation of physics into the system, so it was sort of like cat and dogs and whatever you could see in the picture. Now now there's more advanced methods where they have have physics into it, so I think that's cool. Um, in terms of curriculum, uh, at SIO there's no of putting machine learning directly into it yet, but um, they're free to take the class I teach is on, on upper campus in electrical engineering, but I have students from from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So they they take classes that way. They're very interested in learning it. So the way it comes in here, but I think eventually it will I mean, there's a mass similar to a mass class, I would say, right? But data focused, so a uh, obligatory class. Heidi, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, so I, I think this can be handled similar to the way we we have our students learn the appropriate statistical methods for data and. Uh, and science, scientific applications. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think, um, as Heidi mentioned earlier, I think uh, this is a, you know, this this is something. There are things that uh, machine learning does that, that other other techniques can't accomplish, right? And so, 
decades ago, uh, uh, as a geologist, I, I went into this, uh, you know, it, it, I was one of the first people to start using computers in geology. Most geologists drew their maps by hand. And, you know, we learned over uh, years and decades that there was just more effective ways to do this. And I think that that's, that there will be a natural progression of teaching the students as they need to learn these tools to do the science that, well, that, we, that they that they can't do without machine learning. I can see professional development being needed very quickly for the faculty yeah. um, to be able to teach what's needed. So I think there's training and workforce training at that level to be able to then um, train the students. Mm -hmm. okay. Is it possible to ask the follow-up question? Uh, so this question may be for Peter, but uh, when you train students, do you also teach students about ethical and responsible use of AI and ML methods, or is it just about data analysis and assimilation and making sense of large amounts of data? In other words, how much of ethical and responsible use of AI is included in uh, uh, the education and training? So, So, so I, when I teach it, I don't have any responsible use of it yet. I mean, we are just trying to make the basic methods work and and see how much we can use of data. So it's not, I'm talking about the methods, just like my slides was more focused on the methods here. I'm not focused on responsible use. There's mm -hmm. other... Yeah, I would I would chime in and, and say that yeah every everything should be used ethically whether it's machine learning or any other kind of uh, tool. What does ethical use of AI look like? Uh, I think uh, just like uh, ethical use of any uh, you know, any other kind of uh, uh, sort of like a factory procedure or or any 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 tool that's used to to do anything in society I think it needs to be used ethically. Yeah, those are that comes right down to what is ethical and okay? what is ethical behavior, and you know it's, it's there are many stories of uh, people using AI to try to do something good, like determine who, you know who we should hire to uh, you know to lead our company, and it turns out that they put in the data and the AI said, well, you need to hire white males that graduated from Ivy League schools. Well, it wasn't the answer they're looking for. Right, but uh, they, it was it was uh, data that they fed that was biased, and so you know to, to recognize the biases that you that you put into AI. These are all these are like almost impossible questions to answer satisfactorily. You know what is what is ethical behavior? But I think we always need to keep a check constantly on everything to ensure that it's uh, it's just ethical. And, and AI is new. We have one more follow up question. When we talk about ethical, ethical use of AI and being able to trust AI, I think AI trust goes into that. And how does that fold into uncertainty quantifications? Yeah, you can, you can take that. Yeah, so, but, yeah I mean, we, we, we thought about this a lot in our uncertainties, and it turns out that statistics uh, is very hard. And we, we uh, uh, you know, we come up with an uncertainty estimate. How certain is the uncertainty? Well, you can have uncertainty on the uncertainty on the uncertainty, and so on and so on and so on. And uh, it ultimately, um, you know, I think for in terms of in terms of ethics, there's never going to be a there's never going to be a single uh, easy solution. I think we're constantly going to have to check uh, and, and and question, uh, like we do in science. In, in science, we question authority. All the time. If you're not questioning the scientific authority, you're probably not doing good science. You need to always be pushing the envelope and always be checking to make sure that the answer is better, in fact, than the one you had before. And there's no there's no easy way out of this, right? This is what makes science you know challenging and, and interesting, is that it's it's a constant day of day after day uh, push against the unknown. And uh, we need to constantly push ethically. Marcia, can I ask a follow <laughs> to that? So um, what I'm interested in is you know, one of the concepts of science is reproducibility. Mm -hmm. Is there 
can we have reproducibility in terms of, say, a publication that uses AI? Mm -hmm. Oh, ours, uh, our, yes, our reproducibility, the validation steps uh, in, in the uh, data analysis, we're very uh, concerned about this. We sometimes will do a, a prediction, one of our geospatial predictions, we'll do it several times and compare the answers. Yeah, I'm thinking about, you know, in terms of like a scientific review process, could you have, can someone from, who's say a reviewer of a paper, then use the same um, protocol to see if it, they can reproduce the results? Uh, that's I, you know, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's like training and testing, right? so you can look at the testing data. And... Yeah, I mean there are there are ways to test the science if you're if you're testing whether somebody is trying to pull one over on the scientific mm -hmm. community by putting out fake results. Um, maybe you could train a, an AI to 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 sift out um, you know the, the bad actors, the misinformation, the disinformation. Um, I don't know. I yeah, but I, you know, I'm thinking about it, not just people who are deliberately misleading, but maybe they made a mistake <laughs> uh, and how they how they went about it. Well, I, I think yeah. you know, there, just yeah. So yeah. certainly, you can misprogram something. We can make, mistakes have been made throughout history. Right. And, uh, people will make mistakes, I'm sure, and we've made mistakes in some of our publications. Uh, they exist, and again, it's just this constant sort of checking and questioning. Mm -hmm. Is this the right thing? Did we make a mistake? How can we check to make sure that we make a mistake? I mean, this is all part of the scientific method, and right. I don't see any shortcut around that. And, and I, I, the, the risks of AI, AI allows you to do things bigger and faster, so your mistakes are going to be bigger and you're going to make them faster. So it probably requires more effort to make sure that you're not making a mistake. Um, Mona, you had a question? Sure. <clears throat> so my question is, um, um, one of the statement of tasks uh, reads that we have to look at the research infrastructure. So are AI and ML tools exacerbating existing infrastructure challenges because of the amount of data that researchers have to download to train ML models? And I can see how this would easily uh, lead to inequities between R1 and resource-rich universities and those that do not have that kind of infrastructure in place. Sure. No, that makes total sense. Yes, yeah, so I think, um, as I said, data, this is a data science. And data, you know, big computers, lots of um, disk storage space, lots of bandwidth and, uh, uh, for communications. All these are expensive infrastructure um, components. And these are, these are going to be used more effectively by wealthier uh, entities than poorer entities. Well, you, well, you could use a UNOLS type approach where the big centers have a, a fair access uh, through some sort of, you know, evaluation criteria based on funded proposals, that type of thing. Yeah, for, I mean, for sure, the whole cloud com, uh, storage and compute infrastructure could support something like that very readily. Yeah. No, no roadblocks there besides money. <laughs> 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 Can I add some things about Marsha? Um, you know, one of the things that we should also not forget about are how um, how advanced the large language models have have become. Um, it, there will come a time when we're we won't be sharing time series with people anymore. That the terabytes of data will sit somewhere, and we'll query it. You know, with a large language model, like you know, and that large language model won't necessarily need to go back and, you know, dig into the data. It, it will it will have learned what the data is telling us. It's, it's sort of like how the, the large language models do it now when you just pose a question. Yeah. It does mean the trust and explainability of them. And uncertainty. Yeah. Um, can we take a question from the from the audience who may Mm -hmm. Zachary Gold has a good question that's been on Slido. Zachary? I think it's very related to the, the last question, but the question was sort of what kind of underlying data are needed to supervise the machine learning AI training, and how can we enable the development of such data sets globally, especially in hyper-biodiverse hyper marine ecosystems in developing nations? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, I mean, in terms of what kind of data are needed for supervised training, if you're, if you're thinking about um, bio, 
biological diversity and approach ML approaches to try to characterize distributions of that diversity. Uh, there, you know, there's no two ways around. You need someone who knows the taxonomy of those organisms and is willing to put the time in to annotate images or whatever, whether it's you know acoustic spectra or whatever kind of data you have associated with those organisms, um, and to you know match them up and with uh, annotations. How can we enable that in um, development of global data sets? I think this kind of comes back to shared uh, resources and infrastructure to support um, standardized and centralized and community building around that hard work of annotating image data. It, it, with internet access, I don't think there's a big bar to step over but we do need the infrastructure to support sharing that information and that work. Maybe someone else wants to help clarify. That's for knowledge. Oh yeah, and I would, I would chime in and say, uh, you know, once you think you have it figured out and you develop a system like that, then something is gonna change. You're gonna learn something else that you need to do. Some other kind of data that you need to acquire that, uh, to answer some other kind of problem. So I don't see that this is a, uh, there's no destination. It's not a destination. It's a direction. Yeah. Definitely not a one and done task. It will be part of that ongoing verification, validation, continuing to build out. In, um, you know, we've been annotating images to build our deep learning models for more than a decade, and we're we're still you know adding to the training sets when we're studying the same region because new things emerge or we find new problems we want to explore and we need more facets in the training data. It's definitely part of the research. Um, Jim, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, my, my, question my question has to do with uh, the uh, 3D, AI and 3D in, in the water column where your X and Y sampling scales are very different from Z. And uh, is that a does that pose a fundamental problem or is it simply a computation issue? And if the computation only, is there a rule that you could figure out how much more time it would take than to do a 2D AI? Uh, we're actually, uh, you know, eyeball deep in that question right now. So we, we, uh, we're, talking, we're thinking not so much about the water column, although that's part of it, but also the sediment column. So in our mm -hmm. case, uh, the sediment column is very much more heterogeneous, heterogeneous than the water column. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're... We're looking into that right now, and I, I, my, our hunch has been that it is simply a computational problem. But there are there are some vast differences when, you, when we think of the, uh, the, the horizontal uh, homogeneity of, of the system might be like, orders of magnitude different than the vertical uh, homogeneity. So, uh, I our our guess is that it's uh, it's simply going to be a uh, you know, more of a computational thing. But I, I do think that there's going to be some Kind of change in time that um, that would be required to deal with these uh, you know, vastly, the vastly. It's basically a, a vastly anisotropic problem. Josie, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. This is really a fascinating discussion, but I'm kind of curious in what your thoughts are on the role that NSF should play in guiding and supporting this field as we move forward. Everything from support from you know, computational capacity to interdisciplinary research, developing um, ethical best practices. I'm just curious on what you think NSF should be doing over the next decade. Um, Let's let's start with Peter. What NSF should do? Ah, that I don't think I have much opinion on. But um, this with supervised learning with data sets, I think we could uh, we could use unsupervised learning, and that would. Uh, reduce the uh, demand for having all these labeled data sets so we can label things automatically in the future. Supervised, unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning or so. There comes many new methods on. 
this different quit answer. Yes. So reduce the need for manual labor labeling um, Heidi. Um, yeah, I want to say I want to kind of come back to my point earlier about the need for data to information pipelines that are documented, reproducible, and include provenance tracking, and uh, add that that are also linked to ready computational access that is available for a wide diversity of users, and it, it becomes inclusive and isn't, you know, cost limited for um, anyone to participate in the research. That's a, you know, that's a tall order. And I think there's an opportunity for NSF to lead an interagency charge to kind of uh, tackle these problems that cross um, objectives from NSF to NASA, to NOAA, to EPA, um, and kind of all get together to join forces and tackle this big challenge that's um, comp cyber infrastructure and cost that could be shared across agencies because there's so much, you know, we all need to get together to be able to do what needs to be done um, instead of dividing up uh, the pie. So I'm just going to, since, since this is really important to our study, I want to make sure that we capture what you said, Heidi. So what I got was um, develop information pipelines, which are reproducible with provenance tracking, have data that are computationally ready and accessible, and then maybe lead an interagency charge to make data accessible across the agencies. Yeah, I think that's right. And um, you know, we could we could build on, we don't have to start from scratch. We build on existing success stories. You know, we have important infrastructure and repositories like uh, the Bicodemo um, uh, uh, program that have the potential with, it, with the infusion of investment to be linked to the kinds of needs we have for everything we've been talking about today. They're not ready for that right now. Bicodemo is, um, yeah, it could, it needs, it needs infusion to be able to move forward in that right direction in the future. Um, but that's just one example that's, you know, NSF supported within GEO. There are other efforts within NASA, within NOAA, within the other agencies that could all be, we kind of take lessons learned and build on the strengths of um, the, a combined effort. Maybe I'm being a little Pollyanna, but interagency <laughs> might get us where we need to be in the next five to 10 years. I would echo that, and I've been pushing on that. And one of the uh, one of the hurdles that we that we've come across is that program managers and agencies in general are reticent to uh, fund and put funding into something that's old, old data. So these data go into a repository, but those repositories uh, really frequently resemble data dumps. And again, the uh, the data are in different forms and formats. And so I think. One of the things that NSF and other agencies can do is, as Heidi suggested, get on board with uh, you know standardization. This is what is uh, this is the first bar to get across to use AI is getting your data in some kind of standard form. That that's been a huge hurdle for us. We have we spend a lot more time than I would like dealing with dirty data, cleaning the data. Um, if if um, you know program managers would. Uh, you know, entice people to uh, keep their keep their data clean and usable by others in the future, and and encourage uh, submissions that use legacy data instead, essentially instead of acquiring new data. This I think would get the ball rolling. Marcia, can I follow yes. up with a question on that? Yeah. Um, I'm sort of curious to hear from all of the panelists, um, how much of publicly accessible data they use now for training their various models? And in this particular case, I'm really getting back to this question that if we had public, uh, if we had databases, it's going to help us, right? There are databases right now. We've spent hundreds of millions of dollars in setting up databases. How much of that is actually being used today? Well, I would say that we've set up data repositories that are, you know, uh, 
clumps of data. I mean, people just uh, download all your data in whatever format it comes in. They have a rolling deck to repository, which has been phenomenal for making sure that the data are at least preserved. But that's only the first step. The next step is actually making sure that they're usable, right, and accessible. And so this is this is where I, I think we refer to that. And I would, to answer your first question, we use almost exclusively public data. So we, we there are uh, data from, from Pangea and the Europeans. Uh, the rolling deck repository, the MGBC. Uh, there's lots of lots of data repositories out there that we acquire data from, and uh, and then we we, we Peter, Heidi, do you have any thoughts on uh, the uh, using already publicly accessible data? Um, yeah, I guess I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, uh, in everything I showed today with the IFCB data. All even the raw data, as well as all the products we produce from it, are publicly accessible. But um, I would love to hear from Ajit or others who who think there are national places where that uh, there that that type of data can be deposited appropriately. We built our own system to make the IFCB data accessible. The um, kinds of repositories I'm aware of are very good at accepting. Scalar data, you know, if you measure temperature and salinity, there's a lot of places to put it. If you measure billions of images, there's like nowhere. Um, thanks, Heidi. That's ex uh, actually that gets to it. What I was thinking about, or what I was trying to scratch away at, which is that uh, when I was talking about publicly accessible, I was thinking about where you're using somebody else's data and how we can really help with that. Because with you know, like what we have done is phenomenal. I've seen it with at work in Alaska in terms of equity and things like that. It's actually astounding what how I've seen it being used. But for me, this idea that if we set up a database, it'll help, it'll solve a problem, or if all folks submit their data, it will solve a problem. It's uh, something that I want to sort of just understand better or get your perspective on. Yeah, I think it's up. not just setting up a database. It's setting up a, a, a system of software tools and accessible accessibility tools that make it easier for everyone, the data generators and the data users. Uh, uh, you know, the example you may be familiar with, Ajit, that I'm, I use is the, the IFCB dashboard system, which is supported by web services and APIs that was built within my research group it's now used by almost almost every IFCD user around the world because it makes their research and their work easier to do. And those are the kind of tools we need to build. The thing about the IFCD dashboard is it's a research tool that we, you know, we built. We're not software systems engineers. We can't centralize it. And it's a bit challenging for users all around the world to be able to set up that software and infrastructure. And that's the kind of thing that could be hardened and centralized, very, I think was actually not too big a lift. Kind of like an ocean. <laughs> yeah. tuba. But Heidi, thank you for um, articulating so nicely how, uh, how much work it is to do it right so that people use your data. And Ajit, this comes back to what you were saying, you know, how come there's already data out there and Warren, you're saying we have data dumps. I guess I'm going to get on my soapbox here. I was trying to resist, but one of the reasons I think we're, why people just dump their data instead of really curating it is because our promotion and tenure system doesn't value it, right? And so as long as that's the case, um, you know, are you going to write your next paper or are you going to curate your data? You're going to write your next paper. So we have to change our old fashioned evaluation system and actually align it with our stated values in order to make progress on this. If I might say something, if we could um, somehow equivalent uh, or make equivalent uh, data curation with citations, right? Mm -hmm. So if somebody uses your data, sure. you're essentially getting a citation. And I think we've taken steps to that with the DOI, with DOI on data sets. If we can make that as valuable mm -hmm. as writing a paper to get citations, and if you're Promotion board is then looking at not just your publications, but also how many people Very good. use the data that you have acquired. Mm -hmm. Then there's some, now some incentive. Very good. And in fact, some institutions are trying to move in that direction. But what I'm often seeing happen in committee meetings is um, do they have all of the papers that I'm in cover many per year that, uh, oh, and then they also have the state grades. But 
not you know they don't count as equal like you were suggesting those are cultural yep for sure yeah. another piece of it i was curious also about some of the existing um, data request repositories and the ability of some of these developing systems to accept um types of non-traditional data like different coming from i guess non-traditional sources um traditional can kind of integrate traditional knowledge or input from private actors or just other folks from, that are doing different ocean activities. Um, I'm asking that also because, you know, kind of going back to the training set issue, I noticed that for one of the training sets shown that, like, the Indian Ocean had zero coverage whatsoever. So I'm wondering, you know, how does that come to this as well? Well, this is a running joke in our lab that uh, basically all of our data comes from uh, around the U.S. and Europe and Greece and Japan. Um, yeah, the, the, the southern hemisphere is very poor. Um, I think this actually one of the, I think one of the advantages of uh, using this particular large geospatial machine learning is that we can now at least make predictions in the southern hemisphere, even, uh, assuming that the geology, some of the geology is similar. But uh, and, and also I think it highlights the value of, of going to uh, going to these non-traditional places uh, to acquire data. So there are, yeah, there are vast stretches of, of the globe, and, at least in the undersea, where uh, extremely poor example. And if you look at, um, if you look at, for example, heat flow data, uh, it's it's definitely centered around wealthy countries. So I want to be mindful of the time. Um, I really want to thank our panelists today. Thank you yeah. so much, all three of you. I think you really learned a lot. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation to join you. Much appreciated. Much appreciated, all of y'all's input. Um, so here we are, right on time, Marsha. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and I think we have, uh, it looks like we have no breaks. No, not yet. Not yet. Okay, at some point we'll have a break. Well, <laughs> <don't> <laughs> break. <laughs> I think we will do a quick break. five minute bio, uh, bio break um, and then start the Ocean Life panel um, at 7.25. Is that okay? I mean, 95. <laughs> My computer's still on yeah, that. I am really, I'm really excited about this next panel, and Jason um, agreed to moderate this one. So take it away, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this morning, we're now going to segue into biology. So <laughs> we've got a session here going through the rest of the morning. I believe we have seven speakers, five for five talks, five presentations with seven speakers, and then we'll have a panel discussion at the end with Joe C. C. I believe um, we we'll kind of chunked it up into two or three uh, talks in each session. The uh, primary thing is we'll, we'll do you know, 10 minute talks or so for each uh, speaker. And then we'll have some time in each of those little chunks to interact with the uh, presenters. Um, the first one is by Gabrielle Tanito and Emmett Duffy. And since they're two of them, they have 15 minutes. <laughs> but uh, we'd like to focus this first little session, the end session, on biodiversity issues. And that's followed up by, by Joe Bernhardt. But without me rambling too much further, uh, Gabrielle or Emmett, please take it with me. Thank you, Jason. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully it'll work. And next, the question is, can I go to presenter view? Can I ask, do people see the current slide or do they see my notes as well? We're seeing your notes. Uh, okay, all right, never mind then. We'll just uh, stop that and go straight to here. <laughs> yeah. 
you small words for that group guy. <laughs> okay, are we good? Uh, no, we cannot see your presentation. You, you can't see. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, one moment, please. You'd think I would have learned this by now. Um, here we are. Yes. Yes. Good. Well, thank you again um, for this uh, opportunity and honor to uh, to speak to the uh, to the to this committee on on the Ocean Decadal Survey. Um, I'm speaking uh, with with my colleague Gabrielle here, and we'll tag team this uh, a little bit. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, the punchline, which is that we believe that the coming decade should be a decade of ocean biodiversity. And there are the question is why, and the answer is uh, because the ocean is alive. Um, living organisms uh, make the earth and ocean ecosystem work. They capture inorganic carbon, convert it into biomass that we use for food, pump atmospheric carbon into the deep ocean, and so on. Uh, biodiversity is also important and at the center of essentially everything that we care about as humans, food security, coastal protection, um, a favorable climate, even cultural identity. So without biodiversity, the ocean is just water. Um, this audience, of course, gets that, but not everyone does. Uh, if ever there was a grand frontier uh, for science, it is understanding uh, what that biodiversity uh, is doing. So what do we need uh, to cross that frontier? Um, we propose that we need a major initiative with two components. The first is a dynamic map of ocean biodiversity. Um, the first step in, in understanding how biodiversity is, is influencing uh, ecosystems is knowing what we have and where it is. This is a map of the current long-term biological observations uh, of the ocean of ocean biology uh, that are known. They span about 7% of the global ocean surface, and of course, much less uh, of the deep ocean. Secondly, in addition to that dynamic map, we need some way of systematizing the functions of these species and how they are working in ecosystem functions, in ecosystems, something akin to a periodic table uh, of, of uh, niches. So this is not a new frontier. Um, the biodiversity uh, in 1992, the nations of the world got together and agreed that biodiversity loss uh, is an existential challenge to humanity, along with climate change and desertification. That was a generation and a half ago. National Science Foundation also has identified uh, the, the decline of biodiversity and what that is doing uh, in ocean ecosystems as a, a, a key challenge. <clears throat> as reflected in the previous decadal survey from 2015, what is the role of biodiversity in the resilience of marine ecosystems and how will it be affected by natural and anthropogenic changes? Um, we have made a lot of progress in answering that question, as I believe Dr. Bernhardt will mention in, in the next talk, um, but it is still with us. So one might say that this is a longstanding old question, but what's new is that we think that in this coming decade, we have the opportunity really for the first time to be able to answer the question. And also what's new is that we are increasingly being pressed from multiple quarters for answers to these questions that require data on biodiversity. For example, um, we now have pressing national demands for biodiversity data that are emerging and that we are frankly struggling uh, to meet. Society and the government uh, of the US get the importance of biodiversity and this is illustrated by a flood of policy documents uh, over the last several years, <clears throat> including the president's America the Beautiful initiative, the National Nature Assessment, which is just getting underway now, um, the Ocean Justice Strategy, which is tied to, to the, the, the uh, quality of, of, of natural habitats and resources. And finally, the, the, the transforming uh, transformations for a sustainable blue economy, which is very largely based on living resources in the ocean. And we need to know uh, how those species are functioning in order to do that, in order to, to really bring the blue economy forward. All of these aspirations uh, require data on <clears throat> what species we have, 
and what they're doing. And we are missing a lot of that data. So again, the first step we think is a, a dynamic map of ocean biodiversity. I say dynamic because the ocean is alive uh, and even more so than on land, organisms are constantly moving uh, and, and changing. So this is, this is a long-term sustained uh, issue. To manage those resources, we need to know where they are. On land, the federal government has invested a lot over the long-term in understanding where biodiversity is um, through, for example, the USGS uh, Gap Analysis Program, uh, which also addresses the state of protection of biodiversity <clears throat> and how it may be threatened, <clears throat> excuse me, by by climate change. So this figure shows the map that was published in the New York Times a couple of years ago um, that shows the imperiled, where, where biodiversity on land is most imperiled. This map shows where biodiversity is most at risk in America, but it doesn't show North Atlantic right whales. It doesn't show polar bears. It doesn't show the endangered staghorn and elkhorn corals in the Florida Keys. So there, there, there is a, a, a key gap in public appreciation and understanding, I think. This is the kind of thing that we need um, for the ocean, which in this map is simply a blank white space. So the second part of a decade for ocean biodiversity is some way of systematizing the functions or niches of the species uh, in the system and what they're doing. So on the left, we have something like uh, a, 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 the kind of models that we usually use for understanding how species interact with some of their traits and how those may influence uh, functions that emerge as fisheries yield, atmospheric composition, export flux, and so on. How do we organize those and how do we get the data to organize those into systematic ways of thinking about how body size and stoichiometry and many other traits of species influence functions. Something akin to a periodic table of niches. This is a, a topic that has been um, dabbled with, I might say, in ecology for, for a number of years. And it's a very difficult task, but we may we are on the cusp of being able to do it with, for example, publications of major new gene catalogs uh, of ocean organisms and so on. So at this point, I would like to turn this over to my colleague, Gabrielle, <clears throat> to continue with where we are going in the future. So I think if you would advance the slides, Emmett, to the next slide, please. So we can do this now. Um, underpinning a periodic table, a dynamic map, is um, the explosion of new technologies that are going to be critical in meeting any new demands for biodiversity data. You as a committee talked at length about AI image processing, machine learning, big data requirements this morning. You'll be discussing eDNA later today, and hopefully there will be further opportunities to talk about some of these technologies um, in, your, in your future conversations. We're advancing coordinated genomics approaches, high resolution remote sensing, active and passive acoustics, telemetry, other, other approaches. But for most of these groups are also considering standardized data management and data flow, also data storage and archival, to ensure wide availability of the information and, and importantly that it's available to support action on the ground for management and decision making. Um, so that's an important gap to consider and one that we hope the committee will consider. Um, technologies promise to enable observation over the temporal and spatial skills for which we're being asked for biodiversity information and also in difficult to reach areas and in some cases, um, importantly, at lower costs than some traditional methods. Innovations in data systems and cloud computing um, are, are happening in tandem with in-water and um, remote sensing technologies and will further enable all of this. And we need it to really expand the availability of actionable information for sustainable and equitable development and um, also responsible use of the resources uh, that we're tapping. So next slide, please. 
We do have a strong foundation now for the science and data that are required to establish and maintain that dynamic map and to understand species functions. And this is an evolving space and this positions us differently than in 2015. Um, it includes decades of exploration and data assembly work by many organizations and individuals, including some of you who are participating today. Um, many of the networks on the picture here, and this is not a complete picture, but many of these are focused on co-development of approaches with users and communities to ensure relevance of the science and data and that those science and data output, outputs are benefiting society and openly accessible. Um, some of these are insufficiently resourced, but offer great promise to advance our national needs for ocean biodiversity information. And um, in fact, we think this represents a significant body of work and existing partnership and investment that NSF could really effectively leverage. The Census of Marine Life produced the first nationwide overview of US marine biodiversity. So we have that overview from the census, but it was really qualitative. Um, we can now get quantitative. So to the next slide, please. So we have the tools to get quantitative, but we can't measure everything everywhere all the time. So how do we prioritize what to measure, where to measure, and what data um, to be collecting? The global community has identified frameworks for core biology and ecosystem measurements that we have, you know, as a nation, we have yet to adopt in a systematic way. Um, building on that, a recent global expert task force developed a framework to assess the abundance and distribution of marine biodiversity. And the link to that work is here on the slide. Um, but it prioritizes species and habitats that are ecologically important, societally important, and feasible to measure. Um, and it helps to inform priorities for science and stewardship and um, an investment in that. It, we applied the framework in a case study for U.S. marine protected areas and determined that we likely overestimate biodiversity protection because of data gaps, including sparse information from outside of MPAs, um, sparse information from ocean versus coastal waters and for invertebrate species. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Next slide, please. So we have tools, technologies, networks, and opportunity. We also now have a mandate from above, um, from the highest levels of US government for the specific focus on this work. Um, so this is a, you know, a, a great window of opportunity. Um, to come full circle back to the purpose of this session, the grand vision that we propose um, will really require a major scientific investment that is directly aligned with NSF's mission. Um, and, and in fact, NSF is well positioned, and I think we were hearing reflections on that this morning, um, to lead a US-wide initiative across disciplines and methods um, to enable biodiversity understanding. The US is developing a national strategy for ocean biodiversity that will provide high level vision for actions to support ocean biodiversity coordination, communication, conservation. Um, and the scoping of that is underway and this turtle represents a QR code that you could click on and give us input to the development of that strategy. Um, but implementing the strategy will depend on scientific advances and um, really critically effective leveraging and partnering. And NSF and the community that it supports, um, well, NSF is engaged in the strategy development um, and will continue to be central to this. Um, it's going to require vigorous, wide ranging research to better understand how living nature figures in our lives in a changing world. Um, and it's important to note too, though, that this strategy will be complemented by a national aquatic eDNA strategy that will also be released this summer um, focusing on one key tool for biodiversity understanding. So I think um, maybe the next slide, Emmett, was a closing slide. Well, it's, it is very much a closing slide. Um, most, if not all, of the challenges that we're facing as a society in the coming decade are intimately tied with the network of interactions with living species and habitats around us. Um, and responding to climate change is inextricably linked to the changes in biodiversity. And I think we'll hear more about that later. Um, and the fundamental challenge of social equity is also inextricably linked to the challenges we face with biodiversity loss and change. Um, 
So effectively addressing the challenges of climate, of social equity, will fail without incorporating and really um, implementing a bit, big vision for biodiversity. So thank you so much for the opportunity to sort of set the stage for this conversation today. And I know we're looking forward to some good discussion. Thank you, Gabrielle. Thank you, Emma. I appreciate that. What we'll do is perhaps hold off on comments and questions for your talk now. We'll go to Joey's talk. And then when she's done, we'll, we'll open it up to the community. Uh, Joey, please take it away. Can you all see my uh, yes. slides here? Okay, you're on the wrong screen here for me, but I'll, I'll just turn my laptop this way. Um, okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks to um, Jason for the invitation to speak here today. I'm really excited to um, give you a little bit of sense of my perspective on biodiversity change and how I approach studying it and what the implications of those changes are for um, for human well-being. And I'm going to do very my very best to stick to my time. <laughs> but I may have, slight, you know, so you might have to poke me with a stick here, but... Um, but before I tell you about the work that I do in this uh, realm, I think it's important to tell you how I come to this work. Um, this is a photo uh, not far from where I grew up on the um, uh, on the west coast of Vancouver Island in the Pacific Northwest. Um, this is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. And for me as an ecologist and as a biodiversity scientist, it's important to recognize that the biodiversity that exists within these traditional territories exists because of thousands of years of effective stewardship on the part of Coast Salish people in the past, in the present, and ideally into the future. And what you're looking at in this photo is not any old stretch of shoreline. This is actually a clam garden, which is an ancient form of aquaculture that Coast Salish people use to maintain high levels of shellfish productivity and, and biodiversity in the intertidal zone. And the abundance of these shorelines is reflected in one of my favorite traditional Coast Salish sayings, when the tide goes out, the table is set. And what I really like about this saying is that, you know, in just seven or eight short words, it evokes a living system in which human well-being and ecosystem health are intricately linked, not only through the food benefits provided um, by the shellfish, but also the cultural and spiritual benefits. The other component here, when the tide goes out, evokes a changing dynamic living system. And coastal systems like this one um, and others around the world support livelihoods, um, but these systems are not only you know, experiencing daily tidal cycles, but they're also now experiencing rapid planetary scale change. And this rapid planetary scale change is effectively um, threatening the ability of these systems to support livelihoods as captured in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so I would argue that understanding how living systems across scales respond to environmental change is the most important scientific challenge that we face over the next century. And so in, in my work, I aim to develop a mechanistic understanding of biodiversity change in aquatic systems, and then connect that understanding to consequences of those changes in biodiversity for, um, for human health and human well-being. In particular, I'm going to dive into an example today that focuses on seafood and human nutrition. But when it comes to generating a mechanistic understanding of biodiversity change and ecology, this often requires us to connect our understanding of processes operating at another scale. So for, for example, if we wanna predict how a, com a community will respond to a change in temperature, we might need to know something about how the populations within that community are responding to a change in temperature. And in order to do that, we might, want, we might need to know something about how the individuals within those populations are themselves responding to a change in temperature. And so kind of one of the central themes of my research program is to develop and test theoretical frameworks that allow us to connect understanding of processes operating at one scale to dynamics and outcomes at another. And I do this across scales from processes operating within cells all the way up to, to human well-being. So um, Jason told me I should give you my bottom line up front here today. So my bottom line up front is that Theoretical and empirical evidence demonstrates that biodiversity at multiple scales is critical to enhancing resilience um, and where we define resilience as the capacity of a system to maintain functioning structure and feedbacks in the face of environmental change. And then I'll give you an example of how biodiversity um, and maintaining biodiversity is critical uh, to support human well-being. 
So I'll start uh, just by giving a, a quick overview of the evidence that we have that biodiversity is critical to enhancing resilience across scales of biological organization. So over short time scales, biodiversity in the form of genetic diversity and phenotypic diversity and species diversity enhance resistance to change by increasing the range of responses uh, to the environment and the likelihood that species can functionally compensate for one another following a disturbance or an environmental change. And then both over short and long time scales, responses to changing environments include a combination of phenotypic plasticity and rapid evolution of traits better suited to new conditions. Um, and in the case of evolutionary adaptation, uh, we know that high genetic diversity, for example, facilitates rapid evolution to, uh, to environmental change. And so together, these processes enable population persistence in changing environments. At higher levels of ecological and biological organization, we know that connections among species, populations, and ecosystems contribute to self-organization and stabilize ecosystems in the face of fluctuating environments, um, and they can enhance recovery following severe disturbances. And so, for example, reseeding of individuals from other sites, um, so across communities, can prevent local extinction following disturbance. And so overall, we have evidence across scales that biodiversity plays an important role in maintaining uh, community stability over time by increasing the chance that species um, will be resistant over the short term, um, also by allowing species to functionally compensate for one another, and by facilitating processes such as recruitment, um, which ultimately enhance recovery over longer time scales. So given the, the evidence that biodiversity enhances resilience, um, the, you know, a, a challenge is that, you know, we're now living in a biodiversity crisis um, where biodiversity is, itself is declining in many ecosystems. And there's growing concerns that these uh, changes could directly impact human health. And so my research here in this area attempts to answer this question of what do these changes in biodiversity mean for human health and human well-being um, using biodiversity theory. So biodiversity theory predicts that for species to coexist, they must differ in their resource niches, um, and this leads to complementarity in resource use across um, species, which ultimately leads to a positive and saturating effect of biodiversity on ecosystem functioning. This is an example um, from grasslands. This, this, this relationship has been observed in, in, in dozens, if not hundreds of different um, studies. And we can actually estimate the strength of this relationship by fitting a, a power function to this, um, to this relationship. And this, this B X scaling exponent here um, quantifies the biodiversity effect. Um, oops, sorry, skipped a slide there. Um, but and, and within this framework, we've connected our understanding of changes in biodiversity to ecosystem services, but the vast majority of, of um, cases in this context have been focused on services that are based directly on yield, um, total ecosystem production, for example, but there are actually very few robust links in this framework to uh, between biodiversity and human health and human well-being. And we know that uh, in the case of human health and human well-being, total biomass yields are not predictive of health benefits. Um, and we have really nice example of this from Bangladesh, where um, we've we've observed that over a 20-year period, people switched their diet from consuming a, a high biodiversity diet comprised of many species um, to a low biodiversity diet comprised mostly of farmed carp. And over this 20 year period, even though people consumed more seafood biomass overall, so total yields from the system increased, um, micronutrient intake actually decreased, leading to a problem called hidden hunger, in which people have access to sufficient protein and calories, but insufficient micronutrients. And the reason for that is that seafood um, is, is valuable in the human diet because it um, it provides a range of critical nutrients essential for human health, including protein and fat, but also omega-3 fatty acids and micronutrients like calcium, iron, and zinc. And so what you can see is that adequate human health is really like a multidimensional optimization problem. It's about not just reaching one of these nutrient targets alone, but reaching them all simultaneously. So here we use biodiversity theory to test the hypothesis that seafood species richness enhances nutritional benefits, and that it's not just the number of species in, an, in, a, in a system that matters, but it's also the diversity of functional traits, um, like Emmett was talking about, that matters. And so we, we tested the hypothesis that ecological functional diversity is positively associated with nutrient diversity and therefore increased nutritional benefits. 
So I'll just give a quick overview of what this looks like. We, we envision a scenario of high biodiversity in the diet. And if species differ from one another in their nutrient profile, such that species are complementary, so one species is high in calcium while another is high in zinc, then biodiversity theory leads us to predict that we should see enhanced nutritional benefits. And in this way, we can then connect biodiversity and changes in biodiversity within a system directly to human health and human well-being, because we would predict then that if in a, in a case of high biodiversity, that a greater proportion of the human population would meet their nutritional needs. So just a quick overview of results. We found, um, we found that there's absolutely no benefit of increasing biodiversity in the diet or maintaining biodiversity in natural systems when it comes to protein provisioning, which is this yellow line here. Um, but when it comes to calcium and zinc and the micronutrients, we actually see strong effects of biodiversity, where um, as biodiversity increases, the minimum portion size required to reach a given nutritional target uh, decreases, which means that we can reach our nutritional needs more efficiently with, um, with lower biomass consumption overall. And finally, we found that nutritional benefits are not just associated with species richness, but also ecological functional diversity. Um, and so communities that are comprised of a higher or a broader, broader diversity of ecological functional traits allow us to reach a wider range of nutritional targets um, simultaneously. And so to summarize that, that link between ecological functional diversity and nutritional benefits is important because it allows us to link our understanding of the processes that maintain biodiversity, species interactions, like competition and protection to the benefits that these systems provide to human health. And so to summarize what I've demonstrated to you is that biodiversity in this case we've demonstrated is critical for micronutrients but not for protein and that biodiversity is essentially essential to meeting nutritional requirements efficiently. And so this has important implications when we think about uh, balancing sustainable, sustainable sustainability goals for um, human health and human nutrition with also maintaining biodiversity. So what we're showing is that if we can maintain or restore biodiversity, we can actually reach nutritional goals more efficiently. So I'll conclude by um, returning to this challenge that I um, alluded to at the beginning, which is that kind of a major challenge is to understand causes and consequences of biodiversity change and the consequences of those changes for human well-being. And I demonstrated that an approach to, to addressing this problem is to develop and test theoretical frameworks that allow us to relate processes at one scale to outcomes at another. And I would argue that this is a powerful approach because it allows us to generate a general understanding of change in living systems and what those changes mean for human well-being. And I'll end there and say thanks, and I'm very happy to answer any questions and um, contribute to discussion over the next, uh, or for the rest of the session. Thank you, Joey. Appreciate the talk. Um, it makes me want to do a little more. Thank you. We have a few questions already in Slido. Um, the one I want to flag, and uh, Allison, I, I'll ask it for you as you want to ask it. Oh, yeah. Uh, Joey, sit tight for a second, but Emmett and uh, uh, Gabrielle, you also held the uh, Ocean Biodiversity Summit a few weeks ago. I'm wondering if you could give a, a real brief summary of the outcomes of that, just for the committee's benefit, and then to harmonize where that is going with some of the elements here, and particularly the that Allison was asking if there was an NSF presence there to support. There was an NSF presence at the summit, um, and we've been engaged with some NSF colleagues um, sort of in the development of that, in talking about priorities, for example, for tribal engagement. And also, um, NSF is an active member of the um, National Ocean Biodiversity Strategy writing team. Um, so there's a lot of nice linkage there. Um, I can start uh, with a summary of the summit and then Emmett can pick up whatever I miss. Um, but we convened the summit last month. Um, we had about 100 participants from across federal agencies, tribes and territories, um, industry, investment, exploration, uh, really dynamic, you know, NGOs, a really dynamic um, group, we tried very hard to get broad participation because we wanted to bring together um, 
leaders across sectors and communities to give um, perspectives about why the focus on ocean biodiversity right now is so critical and um, why leadership engagement and deep support is really needed um, to bolster some of those kind of grassroots efforts that I pointed to in one of our slides this morning and um, transform and advance our capabilities with regard to ocean biodiversity understanding and maintaining that understanding over time and developing an understanding, I think speaking to Joey's key points about how um, biodiversity is also intertwined with some uh, really fundamental human needs. Um, so we invited conversations during the summit. Well, first we had an, uh, kind of a fireside chat with Jane Lubchenco from the White House and Andrew Steer from Bezos Earth Fund talking about the context, including looking back to Rio um, for the ocean biodiversity dialogue and the need to really um, develop our collective narrative about the importance of a focus on ocean biodiversity in this time, in this decade. And so they carried really strong messages there. And we can put the link to the, the summit in the live stream in the chat or the recording. Um, and then we, we hosted a series of conversations um, to really invite points of view on um, the needs for ocean biodiversity information among frontline communities who are really experiencing deeply this change um, in terms of biodiversity uh, loss or shifts. Um, we invited a conversation about different perspectives on valuing biodiversity. So, um, you know, how we think about biodiversity from the point of view of how to invest in protections or conservation, but also the value of biodiversity from a cultural perspective. Um, many groups define value differently and we really need to embrace that and understand it. And then a third conversation around exploration and innovation, taking a broad view of, of that and thinking about innovation from a technology perspective, but also innovations that are needed um, in terms of policy and um, societal engagement and that sort of thing. Um, so we had some really robust panel discussions. Um, there is a flurry of activity coming out of the summit. We heard a lot of really positive feedback um, that those leaders that we invited really welcomed the opportunity to interact and engage. And they've been actively following up with us about um, opportunities to pursue actions following the summit. And that that was our biggest hoped for um, outcome was that we would start to see a, a different level of action and awareness. And um, I would say that's come that's that's become real. Um, so it's a it's a nice um, way to sort of underpin and bolster the work that, that we've been doing and the engagement we've been trying to invite around the National Ocean Biodiversity Strategy, which we will release this summer. Um, and as uh, you know, as we mentioned, the a first step in that strategy will be to really focus on in implementation and what actions are needed and what groups can engage because it's not just a federal enterprise that needs to move that forward. Emma, what would you add? That was a great summary. J just a couple of sort of subjective uh, impressions to to add on top of that. You know, th there was tremendous energy, which was really exciting, and of course gratifying for us. Uh, you know, having worked in this field for a while, I, you know, I think there was a real sense that we are at a tipping point in terms of, of really, first of all, understanding the importance of biodiversity broadly speaking. You know, in <clears throat> in in e in in the Earth system and in in human society, and secondly, in the you know the 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 motivation to 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 really uh, do what needs to be done and we heard this uh, from private sector and investment firms and so on so it's very exciting to see the broader um the broader community uh getting involved here you know just one um 
thing as well is is about the the communication and and how we we really present this to to the larger society those of you who who uh, follow Jane Lubchenco's work you know have heard her talk about the ocean being too big to ignore and what she and Andrew Steer uh, talked about was that we need a new narrative for biodiversity and I I think um, it's really striking that that Jane does not use the word biodiversity. Uh, she talks about nature. And we we are the United States is starting this national nature assessment, which for all practical purposes uh, is a national biodiversity uh, um, assessment uh, un, under a different name. Nature resonates more with people. And so um, the the idea of of working on a new narrative, um, I, I think is has a compelling aspect to it. So um, yeah, I'll stop there. I, um, so we have a few other questions, but I'm going to just, Allison, did, did you want to jump in and ask your other question? I can't wait to go on this Um So both Peter and uh, who else was, it was asking about the role of NSF in supporting biodiversity. I'm wondering if any of the panelists have any sense of how well it has to be supported by the university and whether or not that's changed. And, and you touched on that a little bit in your response to the last question, but I think that would be important for us to have a, a sense of that. Again. So we're, that was a question for us or for the committee? I'm sorry, thank, for us. You, you can. It's interesting that, that you um, asked that question because um, we did check in actually with our NSF member of the strategy writing team on this very question and um, and I have some specifics. Uh, with regard to awards or grants, NSF has funded 130 awards um, starting in 2014 with a total of approximately $62 million. Um, and so that's and then there's a, a number of publications cited as a funder in 135 publications since 2014. Um, and these are things coming out of the dimensions on, on biodiversity initiative, for example, um, which some of you may be familiar with, and that's probably a, a good initiative to look back at. I'll just add that it's a little bit difficult to answer that, that question because, of course, there's a lot of research funded by NSF that might not have biodiversity in the abstract, but but of course that is is really important in that way. You know, NSF has has really been a major supporter of this kind of work, um, not just in ocean sciences, but through the systematics and and you know programs in in um, DEB um, and and the LTERs that you know have to understand the, the biodiversity where where they're working. So uh, especially I think for the 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 fundamental science, the basic science, uh, Heidi mentioned in, in the earlier session about it's so critical that, that you actually have taxonomists who have that knowledge that are able to calibrate the eDNA and the remote sensing and all of these other things. And um, uh, some, much of that is also supported by some of the other federal agencies. NOAA has systematics lab at, at the Natural History Museum in Washington, USDA as well. But NSF is certainly a major funding uh, funder for for ocean ocean biodiversity, um, both both that basic level and also you know the ecology of what those species are doing. Thank you. Um, Shmi, I'd like to invite you to ask you a question. Yeah, um, thank you. This question is for Jody. Um, what are some key partnerships to achieving your projects? Like you mentioned. Um, you know, you, you talked about linking ecological health to human well-being, and, and I know you probably didn't have time to get, you know, really into how you might have quantified, you know, qualitatively or quantitatively measured well-being, but you must have some partnerships, um, and we wanted to get your thoughts about yeah, partnerships. Um, but as part of our charge, you know, we're supposed to identify strategies and opportunities for partnerships such as this topic. Yeah, great question. Uh, I think you can hear me. I've lost my mouse. <laughs> um, so the question was about partnerships, um, and 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 what sorts of partnerships I, we we should be investing in developing in order to understand connections between 
ecosystem health and human well-being. Is that what is that is that am I understanding your question correctly? Yeah. Um, so I guess I would say, um, yeah, I would all kinds of partnerships. Um, we currently where I'm working now, we we have um established partnerships with uh government, you know, um relevant relevant government agencies, provincial, federal, um, you know, I'm in Canada now, so Fisheries and Oceans Canada as well as provincial governments. Um, and then also uh developing and establishing trusting relationships with indigenous communities is something that we're investing a lot in right now. And those are partnerships that take um, a long time to develop establishing trust and so on. Um, but I think the key thing about understanding biodiversity and its connections to human well-being is that those relationships are going to differ um, in every single community. So for example, the argument that I gave today that um, protecting or restoring biodiversity is critical for human health and human nutrition is a is a argument that might work for some communities. Um, but for example, for some of the First Nations communities that I'm working with now, that argument is um, doesn't make any sense to them. They, that it just doesn't resonate um, to them. All forms of life are important, and it's not because of their micronutrient content or their calcium content. It's because nature is kin, nature is family, um, and it doesn't make sense to value nature as um, we would when you look at the side of a cereal box and you look at, you know what I mean? Like the, um, our recommended dietary allowance that way, that argument just doesn't resonate with them. And it's just not a compelling, um, conversation around protecting biodiversity. So I guess my, my point there is that I would, um, I'm a big, I would, I would, um, just underscore the importance of, uh, understanding connections in multiple context in multiple multiple communities multiple cultural contexts because those relationships are um uh really differ depending on the community um that you're interested in working with or understanding okay, thank you um we're gonna have one more question to wrap it up and uh i'm gonna call on rick to ask your question which is essentially channeling allison's question that she didn't want to ask but, uh, Rick, please go ahead. Allison, you want to go or you want me to? Either of you. Go ahead, Rick. No? Okay. Hi. Uh, so this is sort of a combination question. Allison framed it as what do we still need to understand about the importance of biodiversity that we don't know now? Mm -hmm. And I followed up with a little more specificity in the sense of, and I say that my question is truly coming from a friendly place. Um, but what is different now about the need for further research on biodiversity in the context of what are one or two big drivers that are not more of the same? And I'm asking the question because I need help when I'm asked that question, what my answer you know, should be. So thank you. Thanks. Joey, I'm waiting to see if you're going to take that first. Yeah, sorry. Can can we? So the question is, can we? What is different now about understanding the importance of biodiversity? Is that I'm getting that? Yeah, right? essentially, essentially, because as you pointed out, it was in sea change, and there's a ton of other. I mean, we all get about biodiversity, but really, what are the specific one or two big drivers now that are not just needing more of the same, more research in it? But what's unique about this moment in time? Uh, regarding biodiversity research. Yeah, okay. Well, I can take a stab at it and then maybe Emmett or Gabrielle can follow up. But I think the key thing is that now we are experiencing rapid scale change in biodiversity um, in a way that um, we haven't, that's unprecedented. So the rate and magnitude of change in itself warrants attention now I would it, uh, uh, relative to other times. Um, and the other component is that I think we're still in early days of discovering and understanding connections between biodiversity and human well-being. So the link that I demonstrated today between biodiversity and human health um, is one of just a few, like a handful of actual robust links that we have directly to human well-being. And the challenge there is that human well-being is multidimensional and it's difficult to quantify, but we we still there's still so much that we don't understand there. So links between um, biodiversity and um, disease prevalence and transmission. There's many, many examples that um, 
that's still a mechanistic understanding of how biodiversity per se is changing and what that means um, for human well-being, we there's still so much that we don't know. So I would say there's just there's there's a there's a lot still to understand and discover there. That would be the argument for me for why we should be studying it. Yeah, I, I would add a couple of points to that. I, I completely agree with with Joey there. I mean, you know, perhaps not 10 years ago, but shortly before that, people were still arguing about whether biodiversity actually has a significant effect on ecosystem function. And in the specific context of the, you know, the number of species, which is, of course, only one, uh, you know, axis of biodiversity, that's changed. I mean, it's, it's essentially... Um, accepted now that that's the case. But it still remains true that the vast majority of research that's been done connecting biodiversity to ecosystem function has been with with plants and primarily terrestrial plants. Um, you know, ecosystems are much more complex than that. You know, Joey's work is is a really nice exception to that um, in 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 going beyond um, terrestrial plants, but also in the really critical aspect of connecting that to people. That that is still a frontier, um, and because it it's not necessarily a you know, a straight pipeline that goes from biodiversity to function to people. People have values, as as Joey mentioned, different communities uh, consider the, the same kind of uh, service in, in different ways. So I guess if I had to summarize it, I would say that the, the challenge now is really increasing the resolution. So instead of using, you know, box models with NZP, we now we we now should be able to, to do box models with with, you know, dozens or even hundreds of different boxes representing different um you know biological components as 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 the ai and and, and computational capacity and knowledge uh, are able to catch up with that okay thank you both for that that was very helpful uh, i know we're running a few minutes late but i see lisa uh, from nsf has a hand up lisa please wait Thank you, Jason. Um, I just want to put one other spin on and, and come back to, to something that Joey's been saying, too. Um, the Ocean Climate Action Plan that Emmett listed as one of his documents, um, I'm not going to lie, it's the Ocean Manipulation Plan. Uh, and so there's a big urgency uh, around how are we going to impact all of this amazing living ecosystem as we necessarily manipulate the ocean to help on on uh, climate action. Um, so and 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 I do think that it's pretty different now in our framing too of the um, ah. I like to listen in on co-production stuff too, right? Non-human relatives. Um, we have a different framing of, of what ecosystems actually are and what they mean to us. So I think both of those are significant changes over the last decade. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was very helpful. So we're gonna shift gears uh, before we do, I wanna thank the three panelists uh, so far. I think you gave us an excellent overview of not only biodiversity and marine systems, but the status of it where we are. And now we're going to switch gears uh, to you know, how biodiversity and other things might be responding to climate change. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Peter. Hi, folks. Thanks. Uh, my name is Peter. Vis. It's my great pleasure to be the moderator for this uh, panel on responses to climate change. I want to start by thanking our panelists for being here today. I know it's it's quite a bit of work, and I want to really appreciate your efforts in putting together your slides. Now, our panelists are going to be talking about organismal and ecosystem responses to earth changing climate. And I've asked each panelist to keep their presentation to 10 minutes. And the hope is that after we get through the presentations, and that leaves us with a half hour for discussion. So, committee members and colleagues listening in, while the panelists are presenting, please, please type your questions in Slido. And that'll give us a chance to try and address as many of them as possible. Um, we are a bit behind, so we'll probably be wrapping up closer to 11.15 or 11.16. Um, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, our first panelist today is uh, Maylin Pinsky from University of California, Santa Cruz. So Maylin, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, I am just, there's the share screen button. 
Does that work out? Can you see my screen? That's great. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, thanks so much. The work this committee doing is vitally important, and I really appreciate the invitation to talk today. I'm Malin Pinsky, Associate Professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And today I was asked to talk about what I see as key research opportunities related to species distributions and climate. Hopefully can complement what my colleagues contribute. I'm already seeing many, many overlapping themes. Um, so just to put them up front, my main messages are that Species are rapidly shifting to new locations in the ocean, and that this has dramatic impacts on marine ecosystems and society. Second, there's a, a massive hole in our knowledge related to the biological processes that drive these shifts and the ecological and social mechanisms of adaptation to these shifts as well. Third, there's a strong need for technology, data, and the computational infrastructure to observe species distributions, especially in the tropics and Southern Hemisphere, where few observations now exist. And finally, I'd argue that we need stronger workforce development in data literacy and the data science skills to enable the interpretation, forecast, and analysis of adaptation options to these climate impacts. So on my first point, we have many observations like the following where this map shows in orange and red, the American lobster used to be found all the way south to Virginia in the Northeast US but now his uh, populations across Southern New England have largely collapsed and the population has contracted hundreds of miles north as temperatures in the Northeast rapidly warmed. More broadly, marine species are shifting nearly 60 kilometers per decade towards the poles on average. It's about, it's nearly six times faster than has been observed on land. So put another way, marine species are the canaries in the coal mine when it comes to climate impacts. So these shifts also reshape entire ecosystems. Uh, one example is when urchins shifted south into Australian kelp forests and in effect, ate them up. Really dramatic changes to those ecosystems. These ocean changes also reshape human society as well. Just to show you one example, this map shows with a red square where large fishing trawlers from Beaufort, North Carolina were fishing in the mid 1990s. Boats now travel 500 kilometers north following summer flounder that shifted north as well. Even more common in fishing operations are changes in the species that fisheries target. Seafood is the most widely traded food commodity. So this has massive economic and political implications as well. The Environmental Protection Agency estimated that future distribution shifts of commercial fishery species in the US could cause the loss of at least a billion dollars every year by the end of the century. Distribution shifts also cause political conflict. We've seen legal conflict between states within the US and trade wars and failures to cooperate on sustainable fishing, even to, between countries that are close allies internationally. So, and yet, despite the importance of species distribution shifts, we don't understand why they're happening and why there's such a wide variation from one species to the next. We know climate and changing ocean conditions are the ultimate driver of many of these shifts, but it's the biological processes in the middle that remain a mystery. Current approaches to this problem often use uh, what are called species distribution models that in effect assume species directly follow the environmental conditions with, with which they were historically associated, even though we know this is much too simplistic. These models skip almost all the biology that we know is important. Just to unpack this slightly, shifting species distributions consist of two processes. There's leading edge expansions and there are trailing edge contractions shown on this slide as persistence, which is the lack of contraction. So trailing edges contract only when a whole host of biological processes fail to enable persistence. That includes phys physiological tolerance, behavior, phenotypic plasticity, phenological shifts and adaptive evolution. And yet, we don't understand yet why some species are able to persist while others contract rapidly. At the leading edge, it's the processes of dispersal and population growth, as well as acclimation and evolution that enable that leading edge expansion into new geographic areas. But again, we don't understand why some species expand quickly, others slowly or, or not at all. It's in effect, this missing biological middle 
in the species distribution puzzle. One of the part of the problem is that we historically have studied this process within disciplinary silos rather than integrating across biological scales and across oceanographic disciplines. A related problem is that most of the research has focused on the physical environment, and yet we know that changing species interactions can have even larger impacts. So these are the indirect effects of climate change, and we're not yet able to generalize beyond individual case studies. So to address these questions going forward, we have a wealth of observations on where species are and where they have been, including from opportunistic observations and from scientific surveys. So these are really an underutilized resource to understand changes in species distributions, especially when combined with data on historical ocean conditions and biotic environments. But what's needed is to more effectively integrate these observations with mathematical theory and pro especially process-based mathematical theory for these range shifts and with the genomics and the experiments to measure rapid evolution, species interactions, and physiological tolerance. So I propose that what we need is a more focused oceanographic research program focused on in integrating across oceanographic and biological scales to address these issues. The second key research need I want to highlight are the social ecological feedbacks around species distribution shifts. Coastal marine ecosystems are not only heavily impacted by human behavior, but changes in the ecosystem in these ecosystems also strongly influence human behavior, including how and where to pursue fishing, um, recreational opportunities, biodiversity conservation, even shipping and offshore development questions. And many of the key questions are around how social ecological systems adapt to species distribution shifts, how feedbacks flow through these systems in both directions, directions, and also which structures or adaptation approaches achieve societal goals. So I think this represents a key opportunity for collaboration between ocean sciences and the Directorate for Social Behavioral Economic Sciences on a funding program to address climate impacts on social ecological systems in the ocean. There are also infrastructure issues to consider as well. So this map shows with distortion, those areas with more observations of distribution shifts. And you can see by how small they are that the tropics and the Southern hemisphere are poorly, poorly observed. Um, this is an equity and justice issue in addition to a scientific impediment. So in many cases, data on species distributions in the tropics and the southern hemisphere do actually exist from historical surveys, but they're not available for research. But changing that requires long-term engagement to build trust, to develop culturally appropriate methods for sharing data, and to develop new programs for observing where species are and how this changes through time. This is a case where single sites aren't enough, to, especially to understand changes in species distribution. So instead, we're talking about surveys across regions, 1,000 kilometers or, or larger, repeated at regular intervals in sort of a regional long-term ecological research program, I think is especially focused probably on the, on the tropics and some of the southern hemisphere oceans. New methods like we'll hear about around environmental DNA, but also machine learning from images can be can be useful here, though I, I also think we don't want to over overlook low tech observations that work really well in low income contexts. This would also help create the dynamic map of ocean life that Emmett and Gabriel talked about as well. Understanding species distribution uh, responses to climate requires making sense of massive quantities of data linking mathematical models with data and the computer science skills to operational, operationalize the pipeline from real-time biological observations to forecasts. So these are highly transferable skills across fields and skills that are in high demand by industry. So I think this argues for workforce training programs that prioritize data literacy, as well as data science skills at all education levels. So the benefits of this research Infrastructure and training would extend far beyond NSF to benefit national security, especially around questions of conflict and international relations over shifting species, 
It would also benefit living marine resource management, including NOAA's Climate Ecosystem and Fisheries Initiative, and more broadly, development of public climate services for the biological impacts of climate change. So that everyone has the information to adapt to climate change, not just the wealthy and the corporations that can, that can afford it. So with that, thanks so much for your time, and I really look forward to discussing this more on the panel. Thank you, Naylor. That was fantastic and right on time. Uh, so really appreciate that. Uh, next up, uh, we'll be hearing uh, from Stephen uh, Marathi uh, from the University of South Florida. Stephen? Yes, good morning, everybody. And uh, uh, it's good to see so many familiar faces. Um, so I want to follow up on a number of points that both Malin and, and I think Emmett made about the importance of not only understanding the distributional shifts of animals uh, and, and plant systems uh, due to climate change, but also their functioning in the system and how these species interact. So basically, I'd like to do um, three things. Number one, uh, talk a little bit about the coevolution of species and how uh, species adaptation um, uh, can occur under climate change and what the uh, implications of change and variability are. Uh, I'd like to cite three quick examples of evolving communities that that we have indexed and uh, the potential uh, changes not only in the in the distributions of animals but but as importantly and perhaps more importantly the ecosystem dynamics underpinning them. And then last, I'd like to follow up on some recommendations, some of which you've you've heard in a different context already. Um, so if we look at the sort of potential biological implications of, of um, changing climate, th there's a whole host of things um, that we um, would anticipate happening under, under warming seas, under sea level rise, ocean acidification, and other uh, symptoms of a, of a clean changing climate. And they include metabolic rates. Mostly, you know, the, some of these are temperature dependent processes, so we would assume that metabolic rates would increase, uh, although not... Um, not you necessarily uniformly. Obviously, um, implications for productivity and growth, which can go either way. Um, primary productivity, um, trophic interactions. These are difficult to predict because of the spatial processes and and dislocations that occur um, and can occur under climate change. Um, uh, obviously, competition and predation are are really important elements of this, particularly when uh, under climate change you may have. Um, uh, predators and prey um, changing distributions differentially. Um, one of the particular um, uh, important aspects of understanding this dynamic is looking at so-called depensatory mortality and LE effects at low population sizes. Uh, and in particular, as we try to recover many um, ecosystems that have been degraded, uh, we, we also have the compounding effects of climate change. And so this represents a really major issue. Um, if we have things moving around in space, and that that uh, basically implies that we're going to have invasions and potentially local localized extinctions as well. And so, understanding you know how a, a species moving into a new area can be accommodated in the system that's there, um, and and of course this spins off issues of host parasite relationships, disease implications, etc. One of the things that um, uh, really conf confounds our ability to um, deconvolve the climate signal is that we have so many other simultaneous drivers and systems, including fishing, eutrophication, and other human-derived um, um, uh, threats to the system. Um, great paper by Scott Doney et al. just published on some of this that um, is worth reading. Um, so when one looks at a um, system, you have a series of co-evolved species that um, distribute themselves on various resource continua um, these are just two dimensions that we often look at in the ocean temperature and depth. And you can see that, you know, these are overlapping ovals in the sense that um, um, there, there are tails of these distributions um, where species overlap. Um, the idea um, you know, primarily is that uh, the oval, the, the major part of the oval doesn't overlap. So as to minimize competition between um, co-evolved species. Under climate change, we can we can actually anticipate these ovals shifting around a bit. And so, for example, um, you could see you know the two um, species on the right hand side moving off as a couplet, um, and so they they become disassociated with the other species in the system. Um, you can also see um, 
two ovals where actually, you know, they don't overlap or that they simply um, move in, in depth space to a different place and potentially interact with other species. So you can imagine uh, how many dynamical processes are involved in these kinds of things. So I'd like to shift gears and actually uh, put some uh, meat on these bones a little bit with a couple of, of, uh, of worked examples. Here's a, a very recent study by Kathy Mills at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute and her colleagues looking at um, uh, these are the NIMS trawl survey data from the Northeast region, and you can see that over um, uh, the 70s to the um, to the early 2000s versus uh, the 2010s, you can see the center of mass of many of these species has shifted northward, uh, which is a um, process that uh, Malin talked about. Um, and when you look at these species relative to how they're, um, <clears throat> sorry, they're, um, how they're, um, uh, temperature preferences and the underlying temperatures have changed, you can classify these animals into what we would call uh, ineffective trackers. That is, they're tracking along, but they're not changing as fast as the temperature. Effective um, uh, trackers, which are moving along, some that have no response at all, uh, nor did uh, they experience warming, and then the so-called effective trackers, right? The, the animals that might be most uh, sensitive to change. And interestingly, if you start looking at the ecological processes involved, th these are um, long-term changes in the growth rates of many of these species. So, for example, you see long-term uh, negative changes in, in the growth rates of haddock on Georgia's Bank and, and other things. And so, so understanding that um, these movement patterns of various species come with um, uh, implications for the population dynamics of, of animals and communities is important. Second... Um, example I want to cite is a um, very well-known um, uh, uh, situation where we've got the so-called March of the Mangroves. It's occurring not only in the United States uh, in the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic seaboard, but um, all over the world. Um, mangroves are limited by uh, lower um, lethal temperature, and as the temperature warms, what we're seeing is expansion uh, into uh, higher latitudes. Um, and, and, you know, so what's happening here is they're displacing uh, existing um, uh, types of ecosystems and in particular salt marshes, right? And so if you look, you know, what, so what are the implications if you're just substituting one habitat for another? There's a really interesting study where they pair, paired up um, so-called ecotones where you've got salt marsh uh, invaded by mangroves and the underlying salt marsh. And what you're seeing here is, um, a large difference uh, between mangroves versus the uh, spartina or the salt marsh grass in terms of um, their um, rates of um, of uh, decomposition. And so, as the rates of decomposition of an evolving um, ecosystem change, that means that you know things um, like the structural complexity, nutrient cycling, and other things are going to change as well. The third example I want to cite is of uh, northward range expansion of an uh, inshore species called fiddler crab. And this is a, an example relevant to one of the LTER nodes up on the north uh, part of the state of Massachusetts. Over time, um, historically, they were never, never occurred above Cape Cod and, and what we've seen is range expansion in the northern areas. Uh, and so um, this particular study looked at three areas in the Plum Island Sound LTER. And what they were finding is that um, in uh, exclusion experiments um, in, the, in these marshes um, with the crabs, um, you had uh, a reduction in the above ground biomass of Spartina uh, as opposed to out, uh, you know, the, the excluded areas. And the finding here, or the speculation was that by adding the crabs, they actually are, are um, uh, under undermining the root systems of of Spartina, and so so clearly there's implications of these things. So I I wanted to shift to um, a number of um, what I would call findings and recommendations for um, addressing these and other con, you know problems that are contingent in, in terms of the implications of this. And first of all. Um, you know, although the phenotypic distribution, uh, a phenomenon of distribution shifts to global warming has been studied extensively, uh, there's proportionally very little on the dynamical system responses, including nutrient cycling, metabolic rates, et cetera. And so I think we really do need uh, a program of, of ecosystem-based research uh, on systems undergoing rapid change. And a number of the examples are, are certainly those that are associated with rapid change. Secondly, um, uh, NOAA and the other mission-oriented 
oriented agencies um, do heavily rely on their ocean going time series. And much of what we know about what's going on in the continental shelves are, are these long term trawl surveys and other surveys that that um, the uh, mission agencies have. But there's a real gap uh, in, in particular in coastal regions. Now, when you think about it, there are a lot of coastal infrastructure that already exists. For example, the uh, NAML laboratories, the near sites, the LTERs, the neon sites. Um, so um, actually combining them in some kind of phenological network would, would actually make a lot of sense. Um, the third um, uh, point I want to make is that um, these kinds of large scale ecological uh, programs are not foreign to NSF. In fact, the USA Globec program, which occurred from the 1990s to the 2010s, was exactly emphasizing some of these problems of both um, the top-down and, and bottom-up effects on things. And so, um, you know, coming up with a, a, a similar type of, uh, of program that uh, might be a joint academic and government initiative to address climate change and impacts seems like something that uh, NSF has already done and the agencies are familiar with. And just to men, you know, make the point, these are the distributions of some of these nodes already. So combining them in some way to establish, in this case, a coastal phenology network would be appropriate. So, and, and of course we have um, statewide surveys that are, you know, haven't necessarily been used for these kinds of things. These are trawl surveys in, in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Um, it, it's really interesting if you look at the uh, raison d'etre of U.S. Globec, it's like its goal was to identify how a changing global climate will affect the abundance and dynamics of marine animal populations. Uh, that's a really good goal, and it sounds like exactly what you all are talking about today. And so this was the um, the Globec time line, and and you can see that you know field programs were implemented in three places of very rapid climate change, as it turns out. Um, the California current system, the north north um, east United States, um, the Alaskan field program, and then also uh, in the Southern Ocean, and um, it's interesting because and many people have said that you know Globec was the the right program at at but it was just a little bit too early, right? Um, so um, in terms of uh, a couple more recommendations, number one. Much of what we know about climate change impacts on comes from the global north. This is a, 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 a point that um, both Emmett and Malin made, um, but the impacts may be, in fact, uh, as severe or more severe in the global south. Um, interestingly, um, the country of Norway has, has tried to address this by stationing, stationing some of its infrastructure in Africa to get the 30 plus countries there to collaborate on this. And so we might want to consider something uh, that might be uh, funded by a number of um, U.S. agencies to do a similar kinds of thing, things, for example, in South America or Oceania to build capacity and to address this uh, fundamental research gap that we've got. And just to emphasize that point, here are fishery landings as they're traded around the world. So with that, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, that was great, Steve. Thank you so much. Uh, and then uh, rounding out our panelist presentations today is uh, Sarah Davies from Boston University. Uh, Sarah, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for this invite. I'm really, I guess, sort of excited, also nervous to tell my thoughts about coral reef changes over the next hundred years. Um, so I'm an assistant professor here at BU, and in our lab, we're really fascinated by coral reefs, as are many people. So these are foundational um, organisms that are building blocks of entire ecosystems. And when you think about where coral reefs live, they live in these kind of oligotrophic waters where there's not a lot of nutrients. Um, so they really rely on this symbiotic relationship. So I've zoomed in here on a single coral polyp, and this is a cnidarian host. So it's an animal host. And inside each of those brown dots is an algal cell. And these are algae in the family Symbidonesiae. And the symbiotic relationship is the algae photosynthesize, they provide carbon sugars to the coral host, um, and the host provides them a home. Um, but there's also a complex microbiome that associates with both the host and the algae. And together we call this the coral holobiont. So I'm really focusing on this coral holobiont, um, so taking a single ecosystem approach from what Stephen uh, was talking about. Um, and it's really these complex interactions between these holobiont members um, that serve as the building blocks for these entire reef ecosystems. And these ecosystems are um, kind of like tropical rainforests. So they provide tons of services ranging from human well-being to jobs in the economy 
coastline protection, so coral reefs are the primary defense against tropical storms, for example, and marine biodiversity. So coral reefs are really the foundation of an entire food web. So they provide nurseries for tiny fishes. Um, they obviously here, we have a fisherman uh, fishing for tuna. So larval tuna, for example, um, are part of the coral reef system. Um, and scuba divers, right, providing jobs um, and economics to local communities. Um, and this marine biodiversity, when it's lost, it has direct human impacts. So when we think about um, how much coral reefs or how important coral reefs are, um, so we've got their global economic value being about 10 trillion US dollars per year. Um, and this is because of social cultural benefits. So 13% of the human population lives within 100 kilometers of reefs. And remember that coral reefs only live 25 north to 25 south-ish, although some are expanding. Um, and 94% of small island nation populations live within 100 kilometers. So really when we think about um, a healthy coral reef system, it really leads to healthy people and healthy populations. Um, so the, but the, unfortunately, the future socioeconomic viability of coral reefs uh, is uncertain. And this is because of a variety of stressors. So um, there's coral bleaching. So this is the healthy coral here that I showed you at the beginning. It's beautiful, lovely. And you might argue that this picture on the left is also lovely, but it's actually really devastating. This is a bleached coral. So what you're seeing is the ni translucent cnidarian host with its calcium carbonate skeleton showing, and it has no algae. So it's done a process called coral bleaching. And if this uh, state persists, uh, it can lead to mass coral mortality. And there's also rampant coral diseases. And there's a variety of reasons leading to uh, increased frequency of bleaching and disease. Um, so when we think about threats to coral reefs, there's a variety of stressors. So uh, they range from this kind of direct exploitation where you have you know, organisms being removed from the reef uh, for food. So top predators like sharks, um, herbivores being removed from reefs and changing the entire trophic structure of that ecosystem. You also have invasive species, so things like the lionfish invading and eating tons of small fish that locally that wasn't a predator from before. Um, pollution, so you can have things like microplastics, um, eutrophication from fertilizers coming in to the water and um, increasing eutrophication of the system. Changes in land use, so removal of mangroves for things like shrimp farms or hotels. Um, but really the primary uh, challenge facing coral reefs is the increase in greenhouse gas emissions. So this increase in CO2 in the atmosphere is warming it up. And the ocean really does the lion's share of um, taking in uh, those temperatures. So as the oceans warm, it really creates a fundamental threat to coral reefs that increases the frequency of bleaching and also increases the frequency of disease. And together, this means that coral reef cover is predicted to decline by up to 99% if global warming reaches two degrees above pre-industrial levels. And this was based on the IPCC report in 2018. I wanna bring us here to this uh, quote from no Nolton et al in 2021. The coming year and decade likely offer the last chance for international, regional, national, and local entities to change the trajectory of coral reefs from heading towards worldwide collapse to heading towards slow but steady recovery. So I think this is really kind of optimistic, right? Um, we're thinking about the future, thinking about saving reefs. However, that was in 2021. And unfortunately, what the last two years has shown us is that climate change is happening at a much more dramatic scale for coral reefs than we were hoping. So this is some dramatic uh, imagery from um, that was taken in uh, 2023 and 2022. So this is a healthy uh, Elkhorn coral. So you can see by that brown uh, color, the coral's healthy. Um, this coral is highly endangered. This was taken in August, 2022. And this is the coral bleaching in the summer bleaching event this last summer. So this last summer was devastating for the Caribbean heat waves lasting months. Um, so really quite a wild summer uh, we had last year. Um, so. But really, we remain very not great at predicting coral responses to climate change. Um, and the question is, why is it so challenging? And I hope to argue today that there's three main reasons. The first is that there's unrecognized coral genetic diversity. There's a normal, enormous uh, algal genetic diversity. And also there's these complex interactions amongst holobiont members that are really challenging to understand. So I'm gonna take you to a story about why cor some corals win and others lose. So that it's thinking about this unrecognized coral diversity. So I'm gonna take you to Palau, this archipelago, it's beautiful. Uh, we sampled at um, six sites and we collected this coral, Parides labata. So these sites, we think of these offshore sites as being more classic sites and these inshore sites as being more extreme. And when we went in and sequenced the genomes of these corals, we found strong evidence for three lineages within a species. So this is looking at the sites along here in the different colors. Um, and these bars 
uh, are the ancestry of individuals. So you can see that each individual mostly belongs to one color. And we see strong evidence for three kind of like blocks of um, individuals. And when we took those individuals and put them under a heat stress experiment, we found variation among these lineages in how they respond to thermal challenge. So we see here the purple lineage, for example, even under really extreme heat uh, uh, had 100% survival. So there's really functional variation within a species that we might be missing. So this is maybe a glass half full uh, story. And when we went into the literature, this was paper uh, just published this week, um, uh, looking at how, how prevalent this, these cryptic lineages are among corals. We see that uh, we found evidence in 24 genera across every ocean basin. Um, so our, the recommendation here is thinking about uh, broad strategies to increase international sampling efforts across species ranges, and I'm using quotes here, um, that include leadership by local and Indigenous communities. So thinking about kind of like multinational collaborative opportunities. And now I'm going to focus on the algal genetic diversity. So uh, the genetic diversity of the algae is vast, um, although it's quite messy um, and quite contentious in the community. So this led us to uh, do an NSF workshop. So myself, Adrian Carrera and John Parkinson run a workshop to try to build consensus about how we assess and, and interpret Symbiodinesia diversity. So diversity of that algal symbiont. And we came up with the idea that there's um, these low com complexity communities that are maybe a little easier to understand where you see that they host in their cells the same color of symbiont, but there's also these high complexity communities that are maybe more challenging to understand because your every sample of coral is a community of organisms present. And so I'm just going to riff off of the recommendations that uh, all of these authors came up with. So um, just because they're already there, um, we wrote a white paper if you're interested. But the first one is that they, we really need to leverage technological advancements for assessing diversity in Symbiodinesia. And again, these international collaborations to better link diversity with function are really needed. And then we need to expand culture collections and taxonomy. Um, now I want to talk about the holobiont interactions and incorporate some of that microbiome. So a lot of the work that's been done is on hosts or symbionts or microbiome, but there's very little kind of incorporating all three members. Um, so we need more work thinking about how uh, Nidarian phenotypes um, will differ depending on what, ty what type of microbiome you have, what type of symbiont community, what uh, genotype of coral you are, and together all of these interactions amongst holobiont members, this idea that you can mix and match hosts and symbionts and microbiome combinations together might yield novel phenotypes that might do well under climate change. So the recommendation here is to think about uh, focusing research on mechanisms underlying how these interactions are shaped by changing oceans so that we might come up with ideas about how we might use these different combinations to try to um, be more ad adaptive strategies. So when we're thinking about coral reef solutions, so how can we keep reefs looking like this, what we see on the left? Obviously, the main thing we need to do is slow climate change and improve local conditions. So efforts to mitigate warming and improve local conditions are absolutely paramount. However, these are major policy challenges. Corals and currents that take coral larvae um, and CO2 emissions, they don't respect political boundaries. Um, so I think um, there's a huge need in the community for um, incentives and mechanisms for multi multinational uh, collaborations. And I, I know that's been touched on a few times today. And I think this will lead to broader engagement with multinational stakeholders that, and will bolster both science and conservation. Um, so now I'm going to talk about specifically actively restoring coral populations, which is becoming um, a major focus of coral reef research. So when we're thinking about uh, restoring corals, um, so this is there's a whole coral restoration consortium. I, I spoke before this talk kind of thinking about what some of the recommendations might be. Um, and these are the ones we came up with. So thinking about national repositories or biobanks to preserve host and symbiont genotypes. So for example, for the endangered acroporid corals in the Florida Keys, um, a lot of those had already been biobanked um, before the devastation of summer 2023. So there's still those genotypes in nurseries. So things like this, where you have an entire population wiped out from a bleaching event, that genetic material and that individual genotype is still available. Um, and efforts to create novel genetic combinations. So the idea that maybe you mix and match individuals from the south to the north and try to think about hybrid vigor to try to uh, increase resiliency of uh, different genotypes and research on the potential risks associated with novel interventions. So whether those interventions are across countries or whether those interventions are quite provocative like moving um, Pacific corals into the Caribbean. Uh, we need research to understand those risks. Um, and we also lastly need investment in host and symbiont taxonomy. Policies are based on species, and in coral and symbionts, uh, we're really bad at knowing what species are. And so last, I want to end here, looking back at this reef. 
The next decade of research will be critical. We must reduce CO2. This is absolutely critical and local stressors while also prioritizing understanding diversity and how this diversity can be leveraged for restoration and adaptive management. And I wanna leave you with my final thought, which is kind of the theme is we cannot conserve and restore what is out there until we actually know what is out there. So thank you. Wonderful, sir. Thank you. That was a great way to wrap up this panel. And thank you again for all three of you for great presentations and, and uh, great timely presentations of that. Um, we have a few questions uh, here on Slido. And so I'm gonna go ahead and um, uh, I guess take it off by, by asking a question to, to, to all of you as well as the committee and attendees. So Mainland made a point earlier about, you know, how we're seeing these species sort of changes in species distribution with a changing climate and we can kind of infer or even correlate the two and maybe let's say that the details if you will in the middle are opaque so um i pose this question you know our models at the point where we can predict either the outcome in other words where will species a end up after uh you know time period x right without necessarily knowing the, what happens in the middle or our models at the point where we can really better understand some of the mechanisms. Uh, so I'll open it up to the three panelists to answer that. Anyone want to kick it off? Well, I'll, I'll try. Um, <clears throat> I think the uh, the um, the field of uh, modeling species distributions. Um, is rapidly expanded, right? And so there's a lot of covariates that people are including in these models, uh, including, uh, interestingly, the density of, of the populations themselves. I mean, there's a number of um, hypotheses called basin hypotheses that if populations get to a low level, they, they shrink their geographic distributions into the core. And so um, this represents an interesting problem, right? Because you've got uh, changing um, uh, ecological conditions and changing uh, population sizes, right? So, um, you know, understanding uh, how distribution shifts relate to both of those factors is important. I, I do think there's been a rapid progress in this. Where the progress hasn't been so great is actually understanding uh, the implications of, of species interactions as opposed to individual species models. Yeah, and I can, I can follow up on, on that. Um, it, I, I tried to make this point very, very briefly, though, just that, you know, the our, our simple approaches right now just relate climate to either species occurrence or biomass or abundance. And yet we know there's a lot of biology in there and it, mm -hmm. climate is actually affecting biological rates and demographic rates. And there are those process-based species distribution models out there that exist but we haven't yet brought them to bear on the incredible range of observations that exist and tied them carefully to and constrained them with experiments and the other, uh, including genomics on rapid adaptation. So I think it's about using models to link between observations and the processes we know, and we haven't yet taken advantage of the opportunities that are there. Um, there's some very simplistic approaches that are easy to apply and have been applied really widely, but they skip the biology that, that matters. And that includes the species interactions that Steve was just talking about and the kinds of basin um, uh, basins of attraction and uh, di um, dynamics that, like that that he was talking about as well. So we have the models, but we're not using them. Excellent. Thank you. Sarah, did you want to add anything? I just wanted to say that, like, I think also it's hard when you're thinking about species occurrence, because my argument would be that, like, we often don't know what species we're working with. So, for example, in Japan, there's been a range expansion uh, of acroporid corals along the Japan coast. But when we went in and sequenced those, they're actually a d they're different lineages. So the individuals that are at the northern range front are a different lineage than the ones that are present in the core population. So it's like they look the same, but they're different genetic material. So it's hard to know who's actually moving because there's no they they're like they look the same <laughs> really good point and you know uh my colleague Shini asked the question about do we have enough empirical data uh you address that to some extent Shini, i don't know if you wanted to add anything to that question yeah i think um Malin might have started addressing it already but um 
you know, having there's there's some empirical data on actual experiments and you know targeting specific questions and can we use technological advances in AI or you know machine learning for for linking those that you just mentioned for, for all kinds. Well, I think that there's like AI, I think can be really useful in thinking about how how more there might be morphological variation that human eye is like missing that might be able to identify without sequencing. So the whole idea mm -hmm. that like we need to go in and sequence everyone is obviously not a feasible idea, but developing kind of tools and techniques, leveraging AI and like neural networks and things to try to, maybe we're missing something. Like we think it looks the same, but it's not. So I think there's a lot of potential avenue for research thinking about morphological variation that we're missing to try to identify who species are. And this goes with like, I know there's colleagues doing this in mosquitoes, for example. So it's like, it's not just corals, like people are trying to think about morphological variation among um, different lineages within kind of like a broader taxonomic group um, that are cryptic, so to speak. So I think there's a lot of potential there. Yeah, I also see opportunities around uh, making better use of the, of the images and the video that's out there and using AI and machine learning to turn those into species observations. Um, obviously, that takes quite a bit of work and careful curation um, and understanding <laughs> what species are out there. Mm -hmm. um, and and I also saw in the chat, you know, uh, acoustic information and other sources of more novel information streams can be useful there too. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, moving on to some other questions here. Jason Link asks a uh, question. Jason, you want to? Sorry, I missed the scope of my question. I originally asked, what's the role of a couple of ecological and biological models to explore all these topics? But I think what I really want to ask is, is what is the state of these sets of models, ecosystem models that they're coupled to physics and chemical drivers? And is it sufficient to be able to address not only this, this SDO, the species distribution, but all the other impacts of seed listed when you summarize and Scott going to state. What what's the state of the model? And is there opportunity? You know, honestly, I yeah. think Jason is probably the one uh, in the room most uh, adequate to answer that question as well as ask it, right? Um <laughs> You know, I would say, you know, if you look at the state of ecological models that are in, in use around the world, you know, the Atlantis uh, system is in, in, in terms of, in particular of, uh, of, of larger animals um, is sort of the state of the art and has a number of mo modules, but mostly, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's keyed to um, species interactions, uh, more or less assuming a constant ecosystem or a, an ecosystem not under the rapid change. So, so having a, a spatially explicit component that can map these species distribution, but also take into account the distributions, that's probably right at the bleeding edge of, of modeling that, that would be really useful for this right now. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add, add on that, you know, it's, I think one of the ongoing challenges is to, and this is, this is also met in, in climate models. It's this, this balance between model complexity, you, know, you can put as much detail into an ecological model as you want, but understanding what detail is important and whether, which detail actually is actually helpful for understanding mm -hmm. both historical and future changes <clears throat> is what we haven't done. So it's really this merge of modeling and data and study on the underlying <clears throat> biological process that I think is, is so important. We can't have just models. And that's part of why I was trying to emphasize this, there are these data science skills and the literacy to merge these, these pieces together. Um, you know, as you know, Jason and others who've worked with them, like Atlantic model, Atlantis models are incredibly complex, but it can be hard to diagnose what's actually going on. Um, and that's part of, it's a computational challenge as well as just something that needs more focus. Great point, Sarah, you have anything you'd like to add? Good with that. Very well. Uh, we got a couple, maybe three more questions at, at least. Uh, let's start with uh, Josie uh, from Trell. Josie, you want to ask your question? Oh, sure. So it was actually going on the little question. I was just curious about invasive species and how it relates to maintaining biodiversity and what we should be thinking about in the future. 
Did y'all hear that okay? Yeah, I mean, I, one one of the things I think is really important from a research perspective is is trying to generalize um, the impacts of novel species interactions, and that's a theme that cross cuts both invasive species, but also the shifting species interactions that Steve talked about and that I brought up a little bit. Um, but I think you know it's often a case where we see that some species, invasive species, have a really big impact. Mm -hmm. Others are not invasive and, or have very little impact. Um, and how do we, understanding the generalizable rules for ecological interactions, building from traits and from taxonomy and from environment um, is a really fascinating uh, and important research question that has both practical and uh, both applied and uh, basic science implications. <laughs> so Josie will appreciate this answer. Um, you know, the fiddler crab example is an interesting one. Is that an invasive species into the Gulf of Maine? Well, I guess it is, right? Because uh, it really wasn't found at any other place. Well, it's it's taking advantage of uh, um, a habitat constraint that's no longer there, right? In terms of uh, minimum, you know, maximum minimum temperatures, right? And so, um, uh, and it and it's going to create ecological change. Um, in general, when we think about this, um, you know, highly packed niches and, you know, uh, species moving, you know, out of their, those, those relationships, it leaves open niches, right, that can be invaded. And so I think, you know, understanding, you know, how uh, a species would fit into a system and, uh, and potentially exploit it is, is a really important aspect of this. And so, um, you know, in in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, invasive lionfish have been, you know, you would have thought that that was a well packed set of niches, but certainly those that species was able to take advantage of something that wasn't there, which was, you know, a predator of of small animals. Right. So uh, uh, I do think uh, invasives. I think we need another definition for what an invasive species is. If it's on a continuum, you know, of distribution, you know, constrained by 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 climate, right. So. Uh, uh, it's not like, you know, something coming out of the Indo-Pacific, right? Yeah, I think Steve's right that there's like, if we've learned anything in biology, there's nothing that's binary, right? So it's like, you know, for example, we think of coral reefs as being really great, but in Japan, where they've like expanded their range, they're overtaking kelp communities. So they've changed the entire ecosystem, right, that used to be dominated by kelp and the fishes associated with kelp. And, you know, that's... Um, like in, from a coral perspective, we're like, yay, corals are expanding their range, right? But those kelp researchers are like, oh my gosh, corals are taking over our kelps. Right. So I think invasive is also just like, depends on your context too. And then thinking about the lionfish invasion into the Caribbean, I think there has been some like really interesting socioeconomic impacts of lionfish. So it's become like an entire fishery. Um, you know, it's a created a, a huge economy. You know, I was in Curacao and there's entire businesses based off of like lionfish jewelry and lionfish tacos and lionfish ceviche. So it's, and it has all of this, so it's like really people associate, you know, this fishing pressure as being like really positive and they feel like they're, you know, being positively impacting the environment by eating this lionfish. So I think it's, it's got this really interesting kind of socioeconomic uh, interaction. That's fun. And they're really tasty. The, um, <laughs> let's um, go to Layla and then Deepanjana and then uh, uh, we'll move on to the next uh, panel. Uh, Layla, you want to pose a question? Yeah, uh, thank you very much with the same line of thought that we're in right now. I'm wondering if the models and species of study uh, or uh, studies of species of change and expansion are considering the built environment, um, fixed structures, vessels, also ballast, you know, <clears throat> Josie's uh, question earlier, the things that microbes and coral larvae and other small things have a tendency to stick to and then fling off of and maybe expand their range that way. You know, Leila, you ask a really cogent question, and I think it's from where you actually sit. Um, so if we look, for example, at the built infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico, you've got a massive number of oil platforms out there. And they've actually fundamentally changed the um, the dynamics of a number of the species, and they've become stepping stones in a sense, you know, for, for um, range expansion and, and, you know, moving to the next stepping stone. Um, uh, they've changed the nature of pelagic species. 
um, that they tend to congregate around these things as opposed to, you know, being being more more you know sort of peripatetic. And so so yeah, I mean, I don't think models have necessarily caught up with a lot of this because there's a big observational gap. But nevertheless, I think, um, you know, humans are embedded in this environment at this point. And, you know, if we want to understand how 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 um, these ecological systems are going to change, um, I think it gets back to the point that Malin made about um, these are these are uh, natural um, uh, and the economic systems at the same time, you know, they're coupled systems. And so so embedding the the human um, element in the in the models is going to be pretty critically important. This is, and as I'm sure folks are aware, we're at a inflection point in many ways, at least for our continental shelf ecosystems in terms of some massive plans for more built structures and offshore development, um, partly to address climate change, but understanding the biological impacts of that um, is still a, a really important open research question. Excellent. All right. Well, then uh, we'll wrap it up with Ivanjana's question. You're on, uh, and you, you could ask about the factors influencing the responses. Yes. Um, Dipanjana here. Gratitude for, again, excellent insights and presentations. I uh, Actually, the non-human intelligence and resilience are also very fascinating subject. So considering the factors which you have presented in your presentation, I would like to ask uh, which factors are influencing these responses most? And can better management or conservation of such response factors, those muscles which are providing the resilience, can decelerate the rate of biodiversity loss? Want to try that, Malin? <laughs> yeah, just just sort of thinking through. I mean, I, I think on on one level, you know, part of what's so important is response diversity and and functional diversity, um, and that get back gets back to some of the cryptic diversity that Sarah was bringing up, um, some of the functional diversity that uh, Joey Joey brought up as well, but that diversity across species provides insurance um, against environmental change so we can ecosystems can continue to maintain function um, despite environmental change I, I think that's incredibly important um, during this during this moment in our history and the earth's history yeah I don't think I think there's also the interaction between stressors too that's really important and challenging to understand so this idea that there's like warming oceans that are interacting with like you know more direct influences like human like uh cl being close to like an urban system for example and all the stressors that are associated with urbanization and so i think there's like really big challenges to understanding i'm obsessed with cryptic so i'm going to make another cryptic thing um but for example when we were looking along an urban gradient in Kiribati um in the Pacific we found that there were three cryptic lineages um and one of the lineages was more commonly found in the anthropogenically impacted areas and then when there was a massive heat wave in 2018 um where if you didn't know the genetic data you would have said oh those corals that were living closer to urban environments all died so they were like less resilient because of urbanization but actually they were kind of like a specialist lineage that was like more commonly found and when we actually genotype them, they were all the same lineage. So you saw the extinction of a single lineage in a local area. Um, but if you interpreted that without knowing the underlying diversity of those interacting stressors, you would have said, oh, it's 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 the urbanization climate change interaction. So I think there is just so nuanced to understand. Um, yeah. So I think there's just like a lot more to learn. I'll just follow up on it and say, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, in trying to sort out multiple simultaneous drivers, um, there's only an N of one of the earth, right? And so, um, you know, we need um, a, a sort of a multi-faceted um, 
uh, approach to this, which includes modeling, you know, uh, experiments on land, it's experiments in water, et cetera, uh, for us to sort of deconvolve all of this. Uh, and, you know, I get back to, you know, what was the driver for Globec One? It was uh, looking at top down and bottom up processes at the same time, right? And so, so I actually think, um, you know, this is becoming even more important now as we, we get into sort of uncharted territory with climate change. Wonderful. Thank you all very much. That was fantastic presentation and great questions. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Jesse Contrell to lead the next panel. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, so I may take my moderator's uh, choice here and give us a, a two minute break, but I'm going to ask I really want the panelists to stay on. We're going to switch topics right now. We've had this great discussion on science. And now we're going to look at when we come back from the great sort of tools and technologies. And I'm calling this part one because we're only going to be looking at eDNA today. And we specifically talked about it. there's a really robust chat going on about other technologies. And uh, we talked about whether we could address all of it today. We decided to just focus on eDNA, but stay tuned because there will be a part two that we will pick up on all of this. But, Let's just take a really quick two minute break and come back. And panelists from the morning, please stay on because we have a full discussion about this one. Paul, can you hear us? Can you try talking? I, think. Oh, I can I can hear people now. I couldn't awesome. before. Okay, we're gonna get started. <laughs> Hold on, Paul. We'll uh people are still getting upset. Okay. Okay. 
not that I'm not asking. Okay, so we're uh, a bit Kelly, we're all set. We're ready to go. Okay, welcome back, everyone, and thank you. So uh, we're now going to talk about um, sort of some exciting things in eDNA. And to uh, talk about it uh, for this session, we've got Paul Barber and Zach Gold, and they're going to do a uh, uh, joint presentation. So I think, Paul, you're going to go first. And That's Zach correct. And so he is your, he's doing your slides for you. Yep. Okay. So um, thank you for the invitation uh, for Zach and I to speak with you today. And uh, thank you to the other speakers for for setting us up so well uh, in, in your talks. So uh, ocean ecosystems are facing unprecedented challenges, uh, climate change, urbanization, eutrophication, uh, over harvesting of resources. And critical questions that we're facing in this coming decade are, Things like, who are the winners and losers of climate change? How are these changes impacting ecosystem function? How can we support ecosystem resilience to anthropogenic stressors? And there's a tremendous amount of ocean observation data from drifters and gliders and satellites and all manner of things. But these observation systems can't tell us about sea star wasting disease or um, you know black band disease in corals. It can't tell you that Garibaldi fish you know now live in Monterey Bay. It can't tell you about non-analog communities where temperate and subtropical fishes are now mixing in the oceans where they never did before. And if we think about biodiversity observations in ocean ecosystems, this is people and, you know, a lot of these uh, traditional methods are people intensive, putting divers in the water, having people go through uh, the, the catch of a trawl. And these methods are time and labor intensive. They're expensive. They require taxonomic expertise, uh, you know, because of this, it focuses just on conspicuous species. And anytime you're putting people in the water, you know, you're limited to the conditions of the ocean at the time. So if we think about the future of ocean biodiversity observation, you know, ideally observation systems would capture entire communities. It would happen at a global scale. It would happen in near real time and it would happen, importantly, autonomously. So we all know about barcodes. We've gone to the grocery store, picked up a jar of peanut butter. We scan it. It comes up with a, a price. And DNA barcoding uses the same approach, but using species diagnostic DNA sequences to identify a particular taxa. DNA barcoding has morphed into what is known as DNA metabarcoding, where using next generation sequencers, we are getting thousands, tens of thousands, millions of sequences. And this makes it possible to identify entire communities through uh, these diagnostic DNA sequences. And you know, we can identify who's there and you know, create a profile of what these communities look like and compare differences between communities, either the same community at different time points, uh, different communities in different locations and things like that. Now, there's some common approaches to meta barcoding and what really differs is the input into the system. So the first thing that really counts as meta barcoding that we didn't call meta barcoding at the time is microbial community profiling. You take a sample, you amplify 16S, you put it into a, a chime, and it spits out a distribution of microbial taxa uh, in your community. A method that has gained uh, a lot of prominence over the last decade is environmental DNA or eDNA. Um, eDNA is based on the fact that 
all organisms are leaving behind small biological traces of themselves in the environment. And that if you go out and you collect water or sediment from that environment, either using scuba divers or a Niskin bottle, you can filter, isolate, <clears throat> amplify, and metabarcode that DNA and reconstruct entire communities. Uh, another metabarcoding approach that is gaining prominence is autonomous reef monitoring structures. These are essentially stacks of uh, settlement plates that get encrusted uh, with uh, benthic marine organisms. You take them apart, they make very pretty photos. Um, and then you can scrape all of that biodiversity into a blender, extract the DNA, and put it into a metabarcoding pipeline that allows you to reconstruct the communities that were present. And so some of the points that other speakers have made that we want to emphasize is that it's really critical to think holistically about biodiversity monitoring and move beyond this very narrow focus that we have on megafauna, commercial species, foundational species, so, for example, in the Channel Islands National Marine uh, Park, they monitor 56 priority species at 37 sites once a year. And that is very coarse uh, observation of the biodiversity in these systems. Essentially, you know, they're flying blind. They, they really don't understand what is going on in these systems uh, on you know a, a finer time scale, and you know if we compare results from eDNA to the visual surveys from the National Park Service, we capture a lot of the same things, but eDNA gets a lot more. And importantly, you know, twenty five percent of Zach's eDNA samples had a giant black sea bass in it in thirty plus years. National Park Service divers have seen one ever. So eDNA is capturing diversity that other methods is missing. And so if you look at the uh, sensitivity of eDNA compared to other methods, such as uh, uh, baited remote underwater videos, uh, compared to beach sands, again, eDNA is outperforming uh, these other traditional survey methods. So the sensitivity of eDNA is higher as well. So in this study, Zach compared uh, fish biodiversity inside and outside of the marine protected area. And what you can see on the right-hand side is that eDNA does a better job of differentiating those two communities allowing us to see the impact of the uh, marine protected area. Now, we talk about metabarcoding and different approaches to metabarcoding, specifically because they capture very, very different communities. So this is data from Indonesia comparing ARMS and eDNA from the exact same sites. And what you see is a shocking little overlap between the tremendous amount of biodiversity that each of these metabarcoding methods captured. And one of the really cool things about these metabarcoding approaches is because you're looking at entire communities, um, you can do a comparison of sites across a marine pollution gradient, uh, which you can see very clearly in those uh, uh, images, non-Photoshopped images on the right of the arms. And if you plot the bio or if you plot the abundance of specific taxa versus the pollution, what you see is that there's some taxa that increase in diversity. There are other taxa that have significant decreases in diversity. And so from a monitoring perspective, if we want to really know what the canary in the coal mine is, you know, these methods allow us to focus or identify and focus on the taxa that are most sensitive to change so that we might be able to re respond to environmental changes proactively rather than, you know, once all the corals have died. So 
it's important to think holistically about biodiversity monitoring because right now what we're monitoring may not be the best indicator species of environmental stress. We need to be moving towards whole communities, vertebrates, invertebrates, microbes, and this is going to allow us to focus monitoring efforts um, on the things that are most sensitive. The other point that several speakers have made is that we need to be thinking about thinking globally about biodiversity monitoring and move beyond US borders, territories, and our exclusive economic zones. So many years ago, Peter Sale wrote a paper about connectivity being a critical gap in the development of effective marine protected areas. And this is because if you want to protect two marine ecosystems here, those ecosystems are dependent upon larval input from upstream populations. And so if we're not protecting these upstream populations, the MPAs may not be stable in the long term. And this is important because, you know, larvae don't respect national borders. <laughs> Other thing we need to be thinking about is that most of global biodiversity is not around North and South America. It's centered in Southeast Asia. And most, you know, 40% of the world's economy and 80% of the needs of the poor are derived from biological resources. This is very true in Southeast Asia, where, you know, it's home to nearly four, 400 million people, about a third of which have fish as a primary daily protein source. Uh, it's a big part of the GDP and supporting the livelihoods of, you know, 120 million people. And it's incredibly threatened by anthropogenic stressors. The red and yellow here highlighting reefs in at risk of uh, local collapse. And it's important to note, uh, as Joey did, Biodiversity is food security, food security is political stability, and political stability is U.S. national security. And so us focusing only on U.S. waters, U.S. territories, um, U.S. interests, we do that uh, to our own peril. Thanks, Paul. Um, hey, everyone. Zach Gold. Um, I just want to first thing everyone, because I'm a product of NSF and NOAA. That's the only way I got here today is because of all of the undergraduate, you know, graduate funding that got me to this position today. And I'm really honored to be here. And I'm going to highlight here, you know, talking about the additional needs that we have. And, and this is about developing those resources that we need to be able to pull off doing eDNA, you know, at scale. And so as is a surprise to no one, there's a lot of studies that have been happening in the U.S. and the global north and not a lot of applications of eDNA and metabarcoding, you know, in the most biodiverse hotspots. But the few that have been done have been really interesting in that when you compare how many species you get in the same liter of water, we get the same number in Southern California as we do in Raja Ampat, which is <clears throat> insane because there's about two orders of magnitude more species of fish in Raja Ampat in the Coral Triangle than there are in Southern California. And so our techniques and technologies and our sample methodologies that we might be using in our biodiversity poor, you know, comparative regions might not immediately translate to, you know, how we do these same kind of surveys, how we're going to um, evaluate these hyper biodiverse systems, right? And so what that means, though, is you can get away with taking 12 liters of water at a site in Southern California, and you did a pretty good job of saturating biodiversity you know, estimates are we need 300 liters ballpark to get the same saturation on a coral reef, right? And now all of a sudden that's not cheaper, better, faster. Um, that's really difficult to do. And so we're gonna have to think about how do we design these tools to be better, to work in places where there are far more species. Um, and one of those tools as highlighted, and you saw in some of the slides that Paul is presenting, those are phylum level or family or order level taxonomic assignments. And part of the problem is our reference databases for these species and has been hyped up by previous um, talks today. We need those taxonomists and we have fewer taxonomists now than maybe we've ever had in the last 150 years. Um, and here's just an example of what happens when you put in the legwork to have some of that taxonomy 
you know, all of a sudden you're turning a light switch on, we can actually put names to faces for these species. I spent the second chapter of my PhD specifically doing that on, frankly, one of the most well-studied group of organisms in the world, which is fishes in the California current. Um, but even then, we had so few um, sequences and reference barcodes that when, by doing that effort, we were able to find, you know, almost double the number of species by actually putting in the legwork, doing the, the museum tissue specimen collections, identifying those species down, the painstaking, frankly boring science that is the fundamentals, right? And you can't win championships, you can't make free throws, right? So we have to be able to do those fundamentals. Um, and here's just an, a further example of, you know, when you further curate those and think really intentionally about how do we design these reference databases, and this was just one really small subset in Southern California, we can improve our ability to assign taxonomy pretty dramatically. Um, and we were actually, by just having this regional curated database that took a lot of effort, um, it took a lot of effort um, to just get a species list of who are all the fishes that live in Southern California, involved interviewing 30 different, you know, sort of fish biologists and pulling together tons and tons of these lists. Um, but we improved and got species level resolution here. Um, and you need this data because ultimately we need to have defensible taxonomic practices for when we do, you know, take eDNA, do DNA metabarcoding, we're putting names to faces as DNA sequences. The only way that we can do that and even test which parameters matter and what does that shape look like um, is by having those databases. And this is just one example we did, you know, for fishes where we found there's actually this direct trade-off between confidence and resolution. This is true in all fields of science, not just, you know, bioinformatics. But the reason why this matters is if you have a hundred million dollar detection of this invasive species showing up in the Great Lakes, you know, on the other side of this dam, um, you better, you know, you know, this is going to the Supreme Court, like you better know that that is the right identification. But if your goal is just to, what is the optimal, you know, number of species that we can identify doing this in Indonesia, we don't actually, there's not a lot on the line. This is more of a research question. You will choose a completely different parameter in this instance, right? And so having that information, developing those best practices is really fundamental, but we can't do that without um, having these reference databases and understanding that sequence diversity for these key markers. Um, but in addition to investing in these reference databases, we have to invest in people. Um, and we can't just let eDNA be the science, you know, of the most well-funded institutions. Um, it has to be democratized and provided. Um, and, you know, these are the future scientists that we, we have to have, and we need more and more of these skill sets. To my knowledge, I was one of the first three students that had graduated PhD doing environmental DNA in the U.S., um, and that was, I graduated in 2020, that was not that long ago. Like we need workforce development if this is going to be the future of how we're scaling our um, monitoring. Um, and really to scale the monitoring, we need to overcome some key technical challenges. And so, you know, it's awesome. I loved spending my PhD in the Channel Islands, diving and taking water samples um, with some of my friends pictured here, but that's not gonna cut it if we need to have the kind of observations that you know, Paul highlighted before and that all the previous speakers were talking about, right? We need to have automated sampling. We need to develop it. And there are some freaking cool technologies coming out of Mumbari and Woods Hole, but what about the rest of us, you know, right? Like we can't all be affording Lamborghinis. Like we need to be able to buy our smart cars, right? And how do we get those off the street so that it can be democratized? Everybody can use these technologies so we can actually scale this, you know, across ocean basins. Um, and another element, and this is something I've spent the last few years really working on is, you know, at the moment, metamarketing is really good at telling us who is present, but not how many and quantifying abundance, right? And we know that abundance matters. You would not manage these two marine ecosystems the same way, but they have all the same species, right? And so if we don't have abundance, we only have presence, we're going to be really limited in understanding how marine ecosystems are changing, you know, in response to climate change, other anthropogenic stressors. And so part of it is developing mechanistic frameworks. This is work led by Oli Shelton at Northwest History Science Center and Ryan Kelly at UW. We're just some simple math. This is the math. The first equation is pulling marbles out of a jar. The second is the PCR equation that we've known about since at least the 80s. Um, and it turns out that just correcting for amplification efficiency bias, doing some standard validation, improves our ability to derive quantitative estimates pretty dramatically. Um, and you might even be able to notice that on the zero there, um, there's a bunch of points that are not explained by the model, and that was why we added the, you know, pulling marbles out of a hat equation, right? And this is just really simple work that's come out in the last year and a half, but there's so much more for, frankly, people that are much better at math and statistics 
to be able to keep pushing and making better tools and models where we can get better abundance data from these. And this isn't even, you know, this is really going from, you know, the DNA tube all the way to through sequencing and more work needs to be done on understanding, you know, from a water sample from the environment, how that actually relates to biomass. But I think we can get there. There's been a lot of really promising results in just the last year and a half that show that we are approaching these, the ability to get there. And the other really exciting work, and I think is really critical and obviously something that NSF has been funding for a long time, but is thinking about long-term observations. Because if we're really going to ask how are marine ecosystems changing over time, we need to know where we came from. Um, and so one, some work that um, I did in an NSF you know, GRIP internship was working with NOAA, taking these ethanol jars. Um, they're actually older than all of my siblings. Um, and it turns out you can just pipette the ethanol off the top of here and reconstruct which organisms were living um, or were captured in these samples. Right. And so you can sample, process, sequence, and reconstruct what's there. Um, and we found thousands of species of zooplankton. We've never had in the California current a long term zooplankton um, spatially explicit time series. Right. That's a fundamental piece of ecosystems that we've just never been able to have. And if we really want to know how marine ecosystems are changing, we need to know how the food sources are changing. Right. And so this is just some pilot data that we're really excited about, but we were able to look, see that temperature is obviously a main driver, which is a surprise to no one, um, but this is only 100 samples, right? There's 7,000 of those samples. This is one LTER, you know, so project associated with an LTER. There are museum samples, collections of these jars sitting everywhere um, around the United States, around the world. These can be leveraged to start answering these questions of, well, what did our marine ecosystems look like? We've never had enough time in the universe to count copepods and identify those species. Now we do, you know, using eDNA approaches. Um, and I just want to highlight this paper that came out in the last week that I think is something that certainly we are thinking about really strongly at NOAA moving towards, which was it took the, the you know, the Australian government, CSIRO, they're sort of equivalent to NOAA spent a lot of time integrating the last decade of all eDNA samples that were taken off of the, the east coast of Australia. And they were able to identify, you know, in the red and the blue, these sort of heat wave associated communities. And the only way that that was possible was investing, you know, in the data integration, investing in the people that be able to smartly put these together and combining the physical oceanography along with, you know, the, the biologists to answer these questions. There's no reason you know, my ballpark estimate is that in the U.S. over the last 23 years since Craig Mentor took the first eDNA sample, there are over 100,000 eDNA samples. There is no repository. There are three, you know, on OBIS and GBIF that have ever been submitted from NOAA. Um, but we could be doing this kind of data. And so it's how do we mobilize data sets that already exist? They're in supplemental data files. They're the raw data sitting on NCBI somewhere. You know, but how do we actually integrate these at scale to answer these big questions um, and, and you know, basically provide this data to the people, like the, the folks on the previous call who can analyze it um, and, and move that to actionable science. Um, and so why is all of this possible? Well, when I was 10 years old, I mean, sequence the first human genome, it cost about $5 billion in today's dollars. Now it's two bucks. There's nothing that has declined costs of, you know, with inflation this fast. And so that makes all of this work possible. Um, it's also incredibly complementary to lots of tools we heard today mm -hmm. and moving in the future, whether that's AI and machine learning to integrate, you know, what do you do with a data set with 30,000 species, you know, in 20 environmental variables? How do you find those features that are important and not, right? Autonomy, putting, you know, Mbari just had a couple of papers come out recently and putting these eDNA mm -hmm. samplers on sail drones, on long range AUVs, you know, how do we deploy these at scale so we can actually have these ocean basin scale, you know, visualizations, combining this with imagery and acoustics. Um, you know, the thing that eDNA is really good at is putting names to faces. What eDNA is not great at is counting, but imagery and acoustics are very good at counting, right? And so it's how do you build those jo joint models, those joint statistical approaches to leverage the strengths and weaknesses of both of them. Um, and lastly, it's, it's really scalable. The one day in Seattle, we processed more PCR samples than all of NOAA has ever combined during the COVID pandemic. We have the technology to do it. This is possible, you know, just do we have the investment and resources to actually commit to doing this? Oh, and so I'll just throw these up, you know, ultimately summing, summarizing that we need to think holistically about biodiversity monitoring. We need to think globally about our biodiversity monitoring. It can't just be, you know, in, in the U.S., these species distributions are going across borders. Um, we have to develop these resources and capacity, both human and the databases. Um, 
And we need to overcome some of these key technical challenges and leverage our long-term observations. And with that, acknowledge many, many people that have made all of this work that Paul and I have done possible um, and happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Paul and Zach. That was really reading a uh, quick whirlwind down in the whole DNA. Um, I, my computer has just decided to die. So it's just fully charged. I don't know what's going on. So bear with me. If you see questions coming up in the chat, um, let me know. But we have a. Okay. Anyways, uh, Brad, you have a couple of questions. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll meander a little bit and then you can figure out <laughs> where the answer lies in this. And it's really pointing to the fact that it's a it's a new measurement technique and every new measurement technique that has calibration and understanding issues. And it's really, I suppose, asking the question of do we really understand where this eDNA that's being measured in the water has come from, what its trajectory is, and whether between species or within environment, there are real differences in persistence or abundance and availability. And it's really kind of understanding of whether the kind of, how do you calibrate and do you understand the, the implications of the presence? Could an organism eat another organism and through mm -hmm. fecal output release DNA and so move DNA, eat DNA around, you know, without the organism ever being present? And so do we really know what's going on, I suppose? Yeah, absolutely. I can answer that question, then Paul, let you um, chime in. So I think, I think the answer is we're learning more and more every single day. You know, do we have a perfect answer there? No. Um, but there's a lot of work that is compared to variability in eDNA signatures versus traditional <laughs> methods. What nobody likes to admit, certainly not at NOAA, is that there's a lot of variability between trawls. But we don't quantify it because... We, it's too expensive to go back and do a second trial at the same site, the same location. But eDNA is actually sort of guilty of, we go in and we're holding ourselves very highly accountable. We take tons of replicates. We know exactly what our variance is, right? And so we can quantify that and we can look at it. And I would say that is a huge advantage, knowing what your variance is and being able to quantify it. Now, your questions about space and time resolution, there's a ton of really cool projects that are going on actively. And there's, in the last year, there's been 10 eDNA papers that have been published per day. I have not seen on top of literature. I don't think anyone in the world has. Um, and so we're learning so much. And But to answer your question briefly, like from what we've looked at in both coastal and pelagic systems, it looks like eDNA really is a snapshot of here and now. Um, and so you're something on the scale of a, you know, a couple hours to a day in terms of time resolution and you know spatial scale of something on the order of, we've seen differences as small as 50 meters apart, as different as 10 meters apart in the water column you know, while people were actively surfing. So there's at least like, you know, four foot waves. Um, and, but in other places and other systems, we just, you know, I did some work up in Kenai River, um, you know, 40 foot plus tidal exchanges. And it's like in those systems, there was an active tidal bore. Like, yeah, eDNA can move 10 kilometers, but that's not surprising um, because it's going, moving, the tidal bore is moving faster than a car. Um, and so I think there's still a little bit unknown about exactly pinning down those questions of, how long and how far and how distant, but everything that we have seen so far is that it has resolution, certainly, you know, on the scale of tens of meters to hundreds of meters in hours. And so I think, and, and it's going to differ in different environmental systems. And so what works in Antarctica is not going to work in an estuary in the Mississippi is not going to work, you know, in the twilight zone, you know, off of Cape Cod. And so I think really understanding fame transport dynamics and, and thinking about integrating, which I don't think is done at scale enough, like, getting those physical oceanographers to talk to the eDNA biologists. There's been, you know, a handful of folks that have been really doing that to nail that down. But everything that we have seen so far is that it is relatively spatially controlled and the results, you know, make sense, you know, with a little bit of grain of salt and especially having those reference databases in place. Um, they're able to answer a lot of questions. Paul, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. I mean, I, I would just, uh, you know, uh, say what Ryan Kelly says very frequently is that every observation method we use has biases and um, you know, whether we admit it or not, you know, visual surveys is an incredibly biased method. Um, and we can show that, you know, 70 or 25% of our samples pick up black sea bass. They've seen one in 30 years. So clearly there's biases I think a lot of established methods 
we've sort of for we we don't talk about how they're biased and so you know it's not it's not about you know uh meta barcoding you know, certainly you know arms doesn't have the same transport issues that eDNA does you know it's a different meta barcoding approach it's telling you about what's in this one you know cubic foot of uh simulated reef so um i think a lot of the methods that we've been using for decades we kind of forget, you know, that these have biases as well. And it's not about, you know, replacing one thing with the other. It's about, you know, integrating complementary approaches so that we can actually improve our understanding of, of how these uh, ecosystems are changing and functioning uh, over time. Um, Susan, you have a so I have a question, and, and I'm just fascinated by your ability to get the, the um, eDNA out of the preserved samples, so the biological collections. But I'm wondering, is there going to be a potential bias in what actually gets preserved in those collections, and and how would we, you know, understand what that bias is? Yeah, absolutely. That's something that we looked into, and there was mm -hmm. nothing, at least in our pilot study, we had we found no evidence there. But it's it's definitely something that needs to be done to calibrate these. And I think um, there's a really cool work that I've heard of coming from Mbari that's going to get published in the next couple months, where they were actually looking at formalin preserved samples over the last thirty years from sediment traps, and they actually did a whole bunch of intercalibration. You know, where they're able to pull recent ones, expose them to formalin, go up to a year, see if they can see detect any changes and impact of that. So I think there's things that we can do in the lab to know if there are those biases or not. And at least from what we saw, we didn't find really have any, any evidence that that was happening. Um, but it's super important to obviously calibrate and validate yeah. for, for as in with any science. And then the second question I had was um, sort of the, the, the problem of contamination if you're looking at um, low abundance species and how do we detect that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's true for the same as the way we were doing COVID tests, right? I mean, it's just like implement controls at every step of the way, have field blanks, you know, this is this the standard of microbiology, like apply that to, and so there's a really great, wonderful standards that people have thought about for a long time. And I think one thing that hasn't really happened yet is, you know, a lot of people came into the eDNA metabarcoding world as fish biologists and the microbiologists were like, this was the third paper ever published, you know, after the human genome was eDNA sequencing. It's been around since 2001, at least, yeah. if not earlier, in some form or another. And so, you know, having better cross-communication between those research fields and leveraging what has been learned and optimized in the medical fields where they have just the same problem with contamination um, and they've built out systems to control for those. And, yeah. and well, it's very I'll, possible. I can give you an example. <laughs> you know, sars cov 2 being detected in England by the public, was it Public Health England? And it was, you know, before they de could detect it in the population. And it was a contamination issue. But it wasn't detected until, I think, several years later that they had the contamination. So that's why, I mean, it's just a, it's a cautionary, you know, sort of example of how it's easy to get contamination and hard to detect sometimes. Yeah, one thing that we've done around that is just to implement multiple replication at multiple mm -hmm. scales. And then you can use that to really understand, you know, what are real detections, what are not real detections by having that kind of built into the site design. And so, if, and luckily one of the advantages of eDNA is because it is relatively cost effective, like it's, you can implement these replication levels at multiple levels in a way that you'd never be able to afford to do that, you know, for a scuba survey or a visual survey. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll take I just was curious to get people's thoughts on um, the issue of data sovereignty in terms of how you do this. Now, clearly, work is done collaboratively, but on the other hand, we're also seeing a lot of uh, uh, regulation of frameworks of regulation on data collection, especially genomic data collection in areas beyond national jurisdictions. So I'm just curious to know how you're thinking about any of that. Uh, you as an anybody, all of us. Is that addressed to the general? Well, I was, hoping, I was hoping the panelists yeah. who are advocating for uh, international. That is yeah. a lovely, why don't we use this as a segue? Um, we are a little bit behind time, but 
Uh, now I want to open it up to sort of the more general discussion. Uh, I love this. We're just going to discuss all ocean life in the next uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> so the kind of transition, and I think it gets into what we need. the previous panel was talking about the need to work globally and international. So um, if you're all still online, uh, please chime in and I am still trying to recover. So if you see somebody on the room that has a hand up, go ahead. Right. Just, just to respond to that, I, I've had some connection around this issue of with the global networks, Argo floats and gliders about the mentoring other national territorial waters. And the key issue that's always come up is any uh, inclination or indication that they're making biological measurements. As long as they're measuring temperature or salinity, most nation states have shrugged their shoulders about for both Argo and even gliders that now allow the gliders to connect to territorial waters. But if there's a perception that they're making any kind of biological measurement, the answer is no. We don't want you there, and it's a big story. And so there is a lot of national sensitivity once you get into kind of the biological measurement space. So I think it is a big issue. And yeah, I, I, historical okay. samples and try to pull out that information, you're kind mm -hmm. of violating understanding that suspect. Yeah, I, I'd just like to 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 add to that. You know, I think um you know, the Convention on Biological Diversity has been, you know, really, really important in highlighting, uh, you know, just how dependent humanity is on biodiversity and getting people to think about, you know, protecting it. But I, I think one of the unintended consequences of this is that because, uh, you know, one of the selling points to developing countries was that you know, the cure to cancer, the cure to AIDS, the, you know, what the cure to whatever, you know, could be on your reef in your rainforest. Um, it is basically equated um, any sort of biodiversity work, particularly anything involving genetics to bioprospecting. And, um, you know, over, over my career, like I've basically seen the evolution of biodiversity science be, you know, it, it's the one use of biodiversity <laughs> that is almost like, you know, it's approaching illegal now, where it's like, even, you know, even in the US, it's really hard, you know, if, if I want to go, you know, collect some animals, you know, to eat, that's totally fine. If I want to collect those same animals and sequence their DNA, it's like, oh, hold on a second, you know, this is, you know, we got to talk about this. And so um, I, I think one of the things that we need to think about as we are talking about, you know, looking at biodiversity, both in the U.S. and, you know, globally is, you know, to sort of push back on this, on this, um, you know, what is essentially the criminalization of biodiversity research. And I, I, I don't use that word lightly. Um, in Indonesia, they actually have made um, there's a national law that any violation of a foreign researcher related to biodiversity research is punishable by multi-million dollar fines and 10 years in an Indonesian prison. So it is being um, it, it, it is being criminalized and it's criminalizing people who actually are doing permitted research without actually doing anything to decrease people doing illegal research. Uh, and um, I guess the, the question was also about data sovereignty, and I, I think that's also important, sort of even beyond um, genetic information, but, you know, sharing data internationally, especially with, you know, countries with fewer economic resources really requires a long process of building trust and understanding how benefits go, can go in, in both ways and identifying what those benefits can be. Um, I, I think there is a, a danger if it's just making data openly available. In some ways, that becomes uh, a, a different form of colonialism in, in some ways um, with countries that have the resources to take advantage of those data using them. Yeah, 
Um, so I think it's that process of building trust and thinking about how benefits go both ways is an important part of the, that international relationship and international collaborations. And, Sarah, are you chiming in on this topic or are you up something else? Sorry, I missed that. Did you want me to speak now? Uh, where I was wondering if you were adding on to that topic or if you were changing topics. Yeah, adding on. Okay, go ahead, and then we'll go to Peter and then Nova. Well, I think this really is like a push for thinking about those multinational funding opportunities that I think should be created because then you can actually give leadership opportunities for people in these places. So, you know, for example, if you want to understand um, the topic was brought up uh, by Paul, like if you want to understand connectivity of a species across its across its range, you need to work with like many countries, and you also don't want the situation where people are prepping libraries in different ways because we know there's like drama, like it doesn't work. So you need like we need ways to like move samples between places, and we need to provide funding opportunities for people to collaborate with us like as equal leaders. So I really think. The multinational funding opportunities is something that like came up as a common theme to all of my colleagues when I was chatting about like research needs. Everyone was just like, oh, working across international lines, like CITES permits, this, that. It's like, and they want to work with people and people in these countries want to work with us. Like it's like, but there's no mechanism in place. So I think it's a real need. Peter. Yeah, uh, I got it. God, I, I, just, I want so badly to add to what Sarah is saying. I'm going to set that aside for now and pick up on what Paul is saying because it more directly relates right now to this, uh, how we're using new technology. So one, I think Paul really hit the nail on the head. It's um, many in our community have spent the last four years working with the United Nations on a, high seas, on a new you know, high seas treaty. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that uh, there's a lot that is going in, into that uh, regarding marine genetic resources. In the next few years, as we're working to advise policymakers on the implementation plan, there is a lot of room for error. And I would also just want to add on a different note, there's a lot of room for opportunity. And I think that one thing I would like to see us do as a community is really keep up the engagement with uh, uh, the delegates who are, who are really working on the implementation plan. So just leave that there. But it does connect in a way what Zachary is presenting. And I have a question. Um, I suspect there aren't enough resources being made uh, available to, um, to, for lack of a better word, cross-calibrate what you're seeing with eDNA and, and other analytical methods, both existing ones or how eDNA relates to, you know, um, you know, how we use eDNA approaches to, to look at the historical archives and the like. Um, do you have a recommendation to us on one thing you think you'd like to see NSF do to help us better establish the relationship between what we see in eDNA samples and related technologies uh, to existing, you know, imagery data sets or uh, other uh, kind of existing uh, approaches and data? Thanks. Yeah, I think the thing that I would love to see there is, I mean, I think ultimately in sort of the same way Heidi was talking about the IFCBs, right? It's like in that regional, local area, how many observations were needed to basically validate that IFCB? I think we need that, frankly, for every real large scale application of environmental DNA, mm -hmm. or at least as many of those as possible, right? And so if we're gonna pick one, I mean, I think there is just a real emphasis on doing those kind of pilot ground tree thing, uh, validation, verification yeah. studies. Um, and I think, and I think the components to that that I think are really critical are having those reference barcodes for the species of interest because, I mean, we're doing this effort across just species that NOAA monitors. Um, our best estimate is it's like 15% have genetic resources. These are the like lowest hanging fruit. Like these are the things that like we actively care about. I mean, some of these are whales for God's sakes. Like, you know, let alone the polychaete worms that like nobody cares about oh, except, for, oh. except for <laughs> except for the people that, you know, like are out here. Um, and so I think like, like those need to be there, but we also need to do much more of that. And I would, you know, I'd point to one of, you know, the coolest, cooler papers that's come out, Oli Shelton's work um, and, and lots of others at Northwest History Science Center where they did side-by-side -side acoustics of Hake trawls and eDNA um, and it's just like boom on the money those maps are there like 
we feel really good that we could, you know, if we just had EDNA signatures, we could interpolate them over space and time alongside those acoustics. And so it's that kind of ground truth thing and work that I think is really critical. And um, it doesn't take a lot to, to add in some of those components. And I think we can leverage, you know, existing LTRs that are already happening, existing surveys that are already being funded, you know, by, you know, indirectly or directly NSF and other sources to, you know, basically add in, right? Paul sort of mentioned this, and, and this is how I feel about EDNAs, you know, it's never going to replace boots on the ground. It's never going to replace white ships on the water, right? But we're never going to have a fleet of 100 global class white ships. I mean, I, we can dream. I don't think it's going to happen. But what you could envision is having 100 gliders complement, you know, our core set of white ships and provide us the icing on the cake to extend to spaces, depths, times that we could not ever get to, you know, with those ships. And so that's really where I think we need to have those that validation so we can scale appropriately because you know as that slide showed like our ocean biodiversity observation or it has not scaled with our ability to measure temperature and salinity and, and other biogeochemistry um but we need to get there if we want to answer these big scale questions um, yeah i have a, a comment on that but also a question that might shift it away so i don't know if other people have comments on on this topic Okay, so um, regarding the eDNA, um, you know, we're we're in Hawaii. Thank you, thank you all for your here, um, the panelists. Um, we're, we're working with you know communities in Hawaii um, to bring you know a lot of the resource managers are interested in eDNA technology and you know what like speaking of data sovereignty, we're trying to provide communities. And I know Ryan Kelly, you know, talks about this a lot too with eDNA Lab, um, providing communities with an agency. To conduct the methods themselves, and then you know the scientists actually providing the guidance for curation, so that the ownership and decision making stays within the appropriate parties. And and I think you know uh, that will, I would like to hear the the party you know the panel thoughts on that. Um, so that's that's one. Sorry, and then um, the second thing is kind of related in that um, you know we're we're also I'm I'm part of the nurse system, and you know we're working on EDNA technologies and estuaries and you know, as we shift the thinking of oceans and humans, like holistically, you know, the coastal regions, estuaries, gulf, you know, et cetera, are, are very crucial areas, you know. So um, speaking of that, what are some strategies for NSF Ocean both to explore these important and timely questions about biodiversity and technological challenges that pertain to the oceans and estuaries or climate effects may be most extreme, like so so sorry, long question, but I would love to hear any any of the panelists. Um, I would I would just add one little bit, but I've been talking a lot, so I apologize. Um, the one thing I would say is like I think what we would want to answer that question of like being able to enable anyone to do the science is like think about NCBI and NIH's support of Blast. Anybody with a DNA sequence can copy paste that. It's not hard to teach you know, anyone with any computer literacy how to annotate a, a single DNA sequence. Um, and it tells you the answer and you don't even need that good of internet connection. We've done this and Paul's done this a million times in Indonesia. Um, and how can you enable that same kind of work for eDNA data, right? You could imagine that actually the Department of Energy already does this, but for microbiome data, but it's only on microbes and they're not allowed to do this work in the ocean, right? So how do you get the interagency calibration between there are, you know, the national, you know, NCBI, DOE, NOAA, to be able to have sort of a data portal that implemented best practices and did all the behind the scenes work so that it just, we're not keeping the data, we just give it to you as an output, right? And so that enables anybody who gets a DNA sequence, even if, you know, you're a tribe in the Pacific Northwest, you take a water sample, you send it off to a sequencing company, they email you the raw sequence data that, you know, they're sitting on it, they have the sovereignty, they can put names to species and analyze it. And we don't need to keep any of that information, right? Like that kind of open source science, providing the tools and resources um, and to be able to do that scale, I think would help help that. And I think, you know, we think about this all the time. Um, lots of collaborators in Indonesia and, and former lab mates of mine, PhD students of Paul's, um, you know, how do we enable them to be able to analyze this data in a country where they don't have a supercomputer, the supercomputers at UCLA, you know, it's awesome that we can do this for the people that we know and, and work with, um, but how do we, you know, extend that globally? And so I know it's certainly a lot of my career is building a lot of these software tools to, you know, diversify and, and allow anybody to do this work. But I think 
we could also build, and NSF could think about integrating these at scale to provide that kind of tool that enables anyone to do this kind of work. So reflecting back on this entire session, we've heard a lot, EDMA, Saber, and this importance of biodiversity, data and see and Joey and other resources, more biodiversity, there's functional diversity, there's many kinds. And Gabby, I'll eminent flood some of that as well. And then Steve said, we need to have a go back too. <laughs> and we're looking at what is the moonshot that this committee might recommend to NSF. So here's my question, and I, I would propose if it's okay with you, Josie, we go back in the order of presentations and just step through each one of the, the speakers. And here's my question for you. There's going to be go back to. I want a one sentence mission statement in each of you. Okay. What, are, what are we doing? What is the emphasis of go back to? Or whatever we call it in this context, the biodiversity, climate change impacts. What's that one bullet point? What's that one statement that you can use to sell this and energize the global ocean community for the next two years? No big deal. No big deal. And uh, <laughs> uh, Emmett and Gabrielle, are you the first to go? Do you want to chime in? I think you should go in reverse order of speakers. Anybody <laughs> 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 want to volunteer? Tackle that one first. <laughs> Steve, you look like you, you could answer that. Well, I'm not shy about this. I mean, uh, you know, I s clearly see the utility and an at scale project that's large enough to actually encompass the range of issues at various taxonomic levels that allow us to understand the implications of a rapidly changing planet on the biodiversity of the earth. And that's my elevator speech. Yeah, I, I'd come up with something fairly similar. I mean, the the future of ocean life in a changing climate, you know, I think that, that really is across biological scales and across oceanographic processes uh, really requires massive integration. Oh, you got your hand up. I'll give my yes. same pitch about the... We can't know what's what we're losing until we know what's there, and that will require multinational collaborations um, across species ranges. Uh, go ahead, Gabrielle. And I think um, I agree with everything that's been said. I think um, you know converging on some standard approaches and some priorities for what we're trying to document is going to be very important if we're thinking we can be. Um, you know, far reaching, but also fairly efficient, even, you know, even with significant resources. Paul. Oh. You're on mute. You know, the more we use Zoom, the worse we get. Um, uh, I think it boils down to integrative uh, ocean observations and, and really sort of adding, uh, this more fine scale biodiversity model monitoring into these other ocean observation platforms we have um, because you know it it will allow us to see what's there it allow us to see how it's changing but by integrating it with all of these other more physical uh, observations that we're taking we can actually start to to understand some of these uh, relationships between these physical processes and the the biological communities. Uh, Emmett, uh, anybody? Joey, chime in. Yeah, the only thing that I would add to that, just to echo, I agree with what everybody said, but this um the the connections to human well-being and particularly for whom the impacts on um 
which communities uh, I think is is critical if we want to understand the impacts of these changes. Zach, I know you're not on Zoom. Do you want to? I don't. I think everyone covered it great. I have nothing to add. <laughs> Nicely done. I think uh, Jason really prepped us up well. Nothing Can I so add good. one component, Josie? I'm sorry. Um, so I think sort of underpinning all of this is um, where it's possible that we're co-developing these kinds of approaches and research and observations and data provision. Um, with groups on the ground that, you know, really require um, help or information or have their own knowledge streams even to contribute. So that co-production, co-development piece is, is pretty critical now. And um, seeing Richard say we need a biological or ocean circulation experiment. Uh, we are almost out of time and I'm going to kind of rip at the last of so forth. So make it a good one. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, I'm asking this question from a perspective of naivete and lack of knowledge, because uh, as folks know, I'm, I'm not a biologist any stretch of the way. Um, but I am influenced, this is a workforce question, I am influenced by a lot of what I'm observing in the uh, uh, medical genetic world, Broad Institute and other places like that in the Boston, Cambridge area. They really have a terrific model of having a lot of you know, hardcore biologists, microbiologists partnering up with mathematicians or applied mathematicians who might not be trained in biology at all. And I'm wondering if there's opportunity or if that is a direction that the marine world of genomics is going. And again, I'm asking this from perspective of lack of knowledge on the part. Maybe this is happening, um, maybe not, but I wondered if there was a desire for that or if there's anything we can do to support um, you know, our report translational research being created and manifest by expanding our fields of expertise that we have doing this type of research. Anybody want to engage with that? I, 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 I do want to comment, but I'll wait for the panelists to okay. before I say something. Go ahead, Mayla. Sure. I, I, just a couple of points. I mean, one, um, there's, a, I think, a, a huge need for bringing mathematical and statistical approaches um, to understanding biodiversity data and biodiversity change. So that's a lot of what we've been talking about on this panel, and I think there are a lot of unexplored opportunities there on the genomic side and you know in the context of changing environments there's a lot we haven't done in understanding genomic functional genomic variation not just species and cryptic species but you know what are the functional genetic differences between different species between different locally adapted populations or individuals and what role can that play in ecosystem restoration in uh, understanding which species are likely to uh, survive changing ocean conditions and, and climate conditions. Uh, so, yeah, I think there is a lot of opportunity that has been unexplored there. Thanks. Yeah, I just have to say, uh, Rick, that actually uh, a lot of the bioinformatics is, you know, there is a lot of crosstalk. Yeah. A lot of the right? The crazy thing is that a lot of it came from the marine realm. I mean, folks went into human uh, uh, genome and things like that with training in ocean micro, aquatic microbiology. The problem is the number of uh, zeros in front of the decimal point. Yeah. Um, you know, the human health angle just has so much more money sure. that you actually have a brain drain going in that direction. Going that way. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's interesting. All right, thanks, folks. I guess I would just add one little element to that, which is I think there's also a ton that they can learn from us. Like sure. we, like one of the things when I started and, you know, Paul and I were first trying to do eDNA, we, we can't get to family level resolution and talk to a marine manager. If we say we found fish in the ocean, no, we're like, cool, you know, like, <laughs> but if you do that for bacteria and for microbes, it's like, well, we've never seen this thing. So it's fine. It's good enough. And so like a lot of work came from that marine world where it's like, we need to put better names on these things. And those actually ended up leading to improved developments in the microbiome space. So I think it's, there's a lot of opportunity in that cross space 
And also, you know, thinking about the leveraging the physical oceanography and AI and machine learning, all of these places, like I think there's a real need for these, these cross. Yeah, and, and I've observed definitely translational is in both directions. And a lot of times those those form mathematical field type people, they're attracted to what we do because it's so messy compared to a, a relatively cleaner world. So they actually really appreciate those challenges too. So you're right. They're in both directions. Well, I really want to thank the panel for uh, the whole panel for this morning on the green light. We covered a lot of topics rather quickly. You, uh, the panelists, you were superb. You gave us a lot of good information. Um, as I said, we will be continuing some discussions about acoustics and, and, and in addition, not just acoustics, but other technologies on uh, um, sensing the green light. But I just want to thank you all. I want to thank you all for hanging in there for a long session um, and this has given us a lot to think about. So appreciation and I think that wraps it up for the morning. Indeed, and I also want to thank all three of you moderators, Jason, Peter, and Jody, for just doing a phenomenal job. Um, and of course, our panelists. I I'm, I don't have a biological background, so I learned a lot here over the last few hours and I have more digging in to do to make sure that um, <laughs> I understand everything with the help of the rest of the community, of course. Thank you.